news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, May 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 13 degrees. In Smith Falls, it's 12. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. One person shot in Ottawa's West End last night. That was just the latest in a string of gunfire and murder in the capital. Jason White following the violence. He joins us now with the latest. Last night's gunfire erupted at Woodruff and Iris just after 7. At least one male was wounded and was brought to hospital. Two vehicles were involved in the shooting and police think that one of them was a newer model gray Toyota SUV with Ontario plates. It fled the scene and likely has fresh damage. Last night's was the third shooting this weekend in Ottawa and the fourth in less than a week. Sunday morning, homicide investigators were at Searville and Meadowbrook in the East End, where 27-year-old Warsama Youssef was found shot to death. Friday evening, a flurry of bullets in an Alta Vista Drive parking lot killed 34-year-old Abdulaziz Abdullah and 27-year-old Muhammad Abdullah. A third man was wounded. Canada-wide warrants have now been issued for three suspects in those shootings, two men from Toronto and a third from Ottawa. The start of this spate of gunfire was last Wednesday when 22-year-old Abdul Qadir Youssef was shot and killed in a vehicle on Palmerston Avenue near Ogilvy and the Aviation Parkway. It's expected Ottawa Police Chief Peter Slowly will speak about this spike in gun violence when he addresses the city's police services board later today. Jason White, City News. City News Time, 9.01, and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Plenty of sunshine for us today, the high near 24 degrees. Tonight, clouds increase the low near 12, and tomorrow we start the month of June with sun and cloud, chance of showers, isolated thunderstorms, 26. For today, the high, 24. And right now in Ottawa, 13 degrees, it's 12 in Smith Falls. Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has upgraded its outlook for the Canadian economic recovery this year. The Paris-based think tank now says it expects the Canadian economy to grow by 6.1% this year. The prediction is up from the earlier estimate of growth of 4.7%. It says a rebound will be thanks to reduced COVID-19 restrictions in the second half of the year as well as external demand. The OECD says growth in Canada for 2022 forecasted at 3.8% compared with the March estimate of 4%, so just a little lower. The improved outlook for Canada, though, for this year came as the OECD forecast global output would rise 5.8% this year. That is up a full percentage point from the last guess back in December. City News Time 903, there are calls for a National Day of Mourning to honour 215 children whose bodies were found at the site of a former residential school in Kamloops, B.C. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau ordered flags on federal building to be lowered to half-mast. Several pre- premiers, including Doug Ford and several big city mayors, like Jim Watson in Ottawa, have done the same. Plans are being made to identify and return the remains, and there are calls for the provinces and the federal government to work with all First Nations to look for remains at other former residential schools. City News Time 903, free weekday passes for 115 provincial parks are available starting next week on Monday. Visitors will be able to get a day-use permit through the Ontario Parks Reservation website. The permit allows you to visit the park for free Monday to Thursday right up until September 2nd. Day visits are the only thing currently allowed. Overnight stays are banned until the province's reopening begins. I'm Andrew Boyle for news anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Separating headlines from hearsay. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Good morning. It is Monday, May 31st. I'm Sam LaPrade filling in for Rob Snow today. We certainly have a jam-packed show for you today. David Smith has been working hard to line up great guests for you all day. So we are going to have uh, lots of discussion today about uh, various topics. We're going to talk with Frank Napolitano a little bit later about the real estate market. 
Are you in the market for a new house? I know I bought a new house and I will tell you the market is very hot. We're going to hear from Frank. We're going to ask him how long he expects this to last. We're going to talk a little bit later in the show with my friend Kenny Vrare. We're going to talk a little hockey and we're going to talk a little football. It is a sunny day here in Ottawa today, but make no mistake about it, it is a dark day in Canada's history as Canadians all across this country learn about the 215 children, the grave site in Kamloops at the residential school that has been found. It is a very, very tragic day. And although Justin Trudeau and Doug Ford and of course our Mayor, Mayor Watson are lowering those flags, that is not enough. Every Canadian should be outraged and we know that there are a number of people asking for each of those residential schools to be searched there certainly was not a grave site at my school there probably was not a grave site at your school think about that for a second a grave site at your school it is unfathomable that this has happened in this country We will speak with Emma Anderson, Professor of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa. We're going to get the take in terms of the Catholic Church and, of course, residential schools. We're thinking about the families. We're thinking about those Indigenous children that were lost. This is a very tragic, tragic time in our history. We're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk with Peter Reuter. Peter, of course, is a dairy farmer here in Ottawa. Peter, welcome to the show. Oh, good morning. Good morning, Peter. Peter, you may not know this, but we went to high school together. Well, there we go. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I, uh, I'm, I'm mentioning that because the day, and I, I, I promise we're going to talk about agriculture, but I'll tell you, just ironically, on the day of your big fire in 2017, I happened to be driving down Prince of Wales, and I always admired your farm. I always admired the work that you've done, and I was heartbroken for you that day. And I know you've recovered. Your your barn is absolutely beautiful. It's It sits beautifully there on Prince of Wales. How has farming been for you during this pandemic, Peter? You know, you know as a dairy farmer, really, my life has barely changed, right? Because, uh, you know, in my world, I wake up in the morning and I do the uh, longest commute in the world of about 30 steps and get to work. And uh, so I've worked by myself with my wife by my side uh, all along. So, you know, in my own little bubble, it really hasn't changed that much uh, work-wise. Socially, for sure, uh, you know, churches are closed. uh, um, You know, events with meeting other dairy farmers or other farmers in general are all been put to a uh, stop. So... It, that part, it's definitely been hard. But uh, on the on the dairy side, people are baking more, and uh, they need great Canadian milk to to make those delicious dishes. So our consumption is actually up. It's been rising through the whole pandemic. So uh, it's been great. It's been good for us. Um, not every other industry has been that fortunate. That's for sure. Absolutely, and you certainly do make delicious milk. Let's talk about uh, year over year. If you were to sort of go back maybe to 2019 uh, and compare year uh, to 2020 or 2021, what kind of increase are we talking about, Peter? Uh, so so you got to remember right during the pandemic, right after the pandemic came through, there was first uh, the, the store shelves were empty of milk. So in March, they called for more milk. And then in April, we went, we, we actually found out that uh, commercial users didn't use uh, didn't use as much milk so we actually had to actually dispose of some milk during that period of time mm-hmm. but uh, so but so April was terrible because we, we probably lost about 10% uh, there but since then we've been only growing back since so uh, from 2000 from January of 2019 till January of 2021 we're actually talking we're probably up around four to five percent in consumption so uh, yeah, that's that's all great news right so uh, in our world in my little world of dairy farming that's been good and when you speak to other dairy farmers uh, how are they finding it are you just one of the lucky ones or is it is it dairy farming all across Ontario I, I think dairy farmers as a whole we 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 realize the the hardship a lot of other people are having and uh, we're we feel very fortunate that we're in a business that, you know, we're sort of a closed loop on the farm. We don't really get out much or we work hard and, and we don't get off the farm a lot. So, 
you know, we're, we're missing the getting off the farm a bit, but we're not missing the work. Like, you know, we still have the work. We still have my cows. I can still talk to them and, uh, <laughs> you know, but, you know, interestingly through this whole pandemic, uh, you know, all of a sudden China started buying corn and soybeans at a very uh, large amount. And that's driven up the price of corn and soybeans by 30%. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like, and those are products that I feed my cows, right? So, it's, it's pushed up the cost a bit, but, um, you know, with supply management, we can, uh, we'll make it through. It's really amazing because, you know, as I hear you speak, I think, you know, we think about farmers, we think about the incredible hard work, but really, you're a business person. Oh, we, we and I think people are, I get lost on that. The, uh, the vision of a farmer, you know, is a, a gentleman with a straw hat and a <clears throat> piece of straw out of their, no, their mouth <laughs> and, 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 and working, toiling really hard. Yes, we'll toil, but most of us don't wear straw hats. Most of us don't chew straw. Um, but most of us, you know, all of us do work hard. But a lot of our time now is spent analyzing numbers. Uh, we, you know, with my new robotic barn, we get into, uh, you know, very small, minute, you know, oh, the cows ate 3% more feed yesterday. You know, did I get a 3% milk increase? And, and like, we're talking very small numbers because our margins aren't huge. And we're like every other business, we have to control our costs and uh and sell our, our 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 product which for me is butter and and a little bit of corn and wheat at a profit we're speaking with peter Ruder, ottawa dairy farmer i need to know more about a robotic barn what does that even mean uh, so so i have a got uh, so my barn stuff not it's not it's it's not new in the industry uh, i say i put everything together but i have a robot that milks my cows it uh so the cows uh they're free to roam in my barn. And so at, at any point in time, they'll walk into the robot. Um, we give them a treat in there. And uh, while they're there eating the treat, we actually, the robot will come out and milk the cow. And then from there, um, so that part, that part's taken care of. On the other side, I have a robotic feeding system. So um, if the manger says it's empty, the robot goes to my kitchen and makes another meal for them. And uh, so that part's taken care of. And then on the far side, I have a, I have a robotic calf feeder, so the newborn calves, because the cows, we harvest the milk for, uh, to sell to humans, so, but the calves still get uh, milk. The cows produce approximately 40 liters of milk, and the calves need approximately 10, so that difference is what we sell. Um, the interesting part is uh, here we'll, uh, we go on to the, calf, the robotic calf feeder, and uh, those calves will uh, eat just... You know, they, they drink milk for about two months there. So that part's robotic. So in a way, I put it all together and uh, the industry works, uh, the, the, the farm works much le- less labor, but more management. Um, and I'm probably producing 40% more milk than I was in my old barn. That is incredible. You have totally amazed me. I, I had no idea. I mean, obviously, I'm not uh, talking about farms every day, but that is incredible to me. So you don't need me to stop by and uh, milk any cows for you then? No, no. And ironically, <laughs> like after this COVID's over, uh, I hope to open up the farm like we've given tours in the past and, uh, and, and show, the, show the consumers where our industry has gone. Uh, most consumers, you know, still think we milk the cows by hand. And, and I mean, that's that's 60 years ago technology and we've moved 60 years ahead and we've probably got some of the uh, highest rate of technology used in the industry in dairy farming because it is a backbreaking work and, mm-hmm. and you know, any time technology comes in, it's a little less physical work, but more a little more mental work. Absolutely. Let's talk about the weather. If there's one thing farmers sure. like talking about, it's the <laughs> weather. Of course, we've had uh, kind of weird weather, really. We've got that super hot days and, of course, a bit of frost. And, and there hasn't been a lot of rain. Does this uh, all worry you, Peter? Uh, it, it's starting to get a concern. Um, I know in my little bubble here where I'm on Prince of Wales Drive, we've actually had rain uh, in April, uh, we had a little bit of rain in April. We had some rain early in May. Um, so with my crops that I planted the first weeks of May, they're all out of the ground and growing very nicely. But they are looking at me going, ah, a little bit of rain would come handy here, you know. Um, so, but other parts of the area in eastern Ontario are not quite so, uh, so, so easy to work with, right? So like a lot around Russell and, and, em- and Embrum, and in that way they're very dry, and you go up towards Spencerville, that where they're dry and this past weekend of course we had uh, frost so a lot of crops 
that were planted really, really early could have been stunted by that frost. I've been fortunate. We had no frost here at all. So, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I'm thinking I'm one of the lucky ones. And, uh, you know, a dairy farmer or any farmer, really, we have to always look at the glass three quarters full because uh, there's always something around the corner that can uh, knock us off our perch. For sure. And three quarters full of uh, delicious milk, I'm sure. Yeah, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter Reuter, Ottawa dairy farmer. And I can't tell you enough how much we appreciate all the hard work you do, Peter. No problem. And, uh, you know, all the, uh, all the farmers are out there happy that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're just happy to produce the food that you love, everybody loves eating. Very grateful. Thank you so much, my friend. No problem. Have a great day. Take care. When we come back, let's talk a little real estate. Frank Napolitano is going to join us. Stay with us here on City News. So the birth of Absinthe was uh, 2002, I think, 2003, and I was working at Urban Bistro um, happily, uh, where uh, Allium is now. Uh, and then uh, the space where Holland Cafe was uh, came up. It's on the corner of Spencer and Holland. And uh, I spoke to the landlord, and there's a lot of interest from a lot of other people, but he and I just you know, got along super well, and he put a lot of faith in me. So uh, Carmen Turner is his name. He, uh, he gave me the lease to the place and, and really pretty much gave me all the equipment in the place. I was really lucky. I've been really lucky with landlords that way, actually, both my current landlord and Carmen Turner. Because um, if there hadn't been Carmen Turner, there wouldn't have been Absinthe. So we were there for a few years uh, and just sort of outgrew the place. And then now we're here. It's obviously been tough and it's been tough for everyone. I mean, that's the, you know, for it's the, been the big democratic sweep of like in restaurants and the hospitality and the arts that we were talking about earlier. It's like everybody's been impacted pretty much the same. Um, from everybody that I talk to, we're down 80, 75, 80 percent. We're and we're climbing out now. Um, I think the one of the saddest things is like we like everybody. We went down to two employees from 25, um, and we're now at four, and we're bringing two new people on this week, so we'll be at six. So it's you know little steps. So it's been tough. It's you know. Um, I've got the most expensive uh, clubhouse ever here because some days you come and you don't do any business, but you're here. But I'm, I'm grateful for what I do have. I think everybody's optimistic now, um, n not necessarily just about the vaccine, but about like the, the vaccine, spring, being able to be outside. I think you're going to see a lot of like pop-up things happen in parking lots and on sidewalks and all and like that rather than being actually inside somebody's commerce. I think we'd like to take it outside. Um, I know my staff would. My staff like the outdoors now all of a sudden, you know, all four of us, um, six soon. Uh, but um, we'll, we'll be doing stuff, some business in the patio in the parking lot and we have a patio out front. And I think other, and I hope other restaurants and stores will do the same. I hope that they take advantage of like the sidewalk and doing sort of you know uh, guerrilla marketing and stuff like that and really shaking it up a bit you can find us at absinthe cafe at 1208 wellington street west in hindenburg and you can find us online at absinthecafe.ca Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sam LaPad, filling in for Rob Snow. Have you tried to buy a house recently, or maybe you have your house on the market, or maybe you just dream about being a first time home buyer? We wanted to speak with Frank Napolitano today. Hi, Frank. Good morning, Sam. Frank, as a mortgage broker, of course, Mortgage Brokers Ottawa, you must be very busy. Uh, it's been it's been hectic the last 16 months. Had you told me when this pandemic started we would have been as busy as we are, I would have said, you're crazy. That's impossible. I, if anything, there was a fear of, obviously, I think when this first started, most of us uh, being homeowners or in the industry were saying, uh-oh, 
like our house value is going to come down. And instead, obviously, what we've seen is the exact opposite happen. Mm -hmm. It really is uh, incredible. I know I had a couple of friends that uh, were trying to sell their house sort of March and April, and they were very nervous. And each of them got about 40000 over asking. And of course, that was at the beginning of the pandemic. We've just seen that escalate. When does it stop or does it stop, Frank? Well, it's going to stop eventually. I just don't know what that date is. I mean, I think we can see the light at the end of the tunnel with this end of this pandemic, or at least some normalcy coming back. Uh, it feels like we've already started to see, I mean, you know, for most of 2021 so far, there's been maybe 12 or 1300 listings available. All of a sudden we're up to 1800, 1900 listings over the last couple of weeks have outpaced sales, which is again a good sign for this market coming back to normal definitely uh i've seen two offers over the last two weeks where the clients have actually purchased homes at less than the listing price and that was didn't see that at all uh there's some rule changes coming into play effective tomorrow so i mean really um, i think they're minor the qualifying rate for a mortgage is going from 4.79 up to 5.25 and this is um, you know, the governing body's way of maybe cooling off the market. I don't think it's going to cool it off that much. I think the fact that we're getting back to normal is actually more to do with this market getting, you know, getting back to where it was and not the craziness we've seen over the last, especially over the last eight months. Mm -hmm, for sure. Let's talk about new home builders. I, for one, uh, purchased a house in September, but I'm not going to get it for two years, of course, for lots of different reasons, COVID in there, mm -hmm. of course. But uh, so, you know, for someone, let's say, that's, that's trying to buy from a new home builder, um, how does it change in terms of the market right now? Because, of course, we're all nervous about what our houses are going to sell for. You know, it's kind of a, a, a double whammy there. It really is because, I mean, anybody that bought a house from a new builder over the last year, year and a half now, you know, before they even move in, their house has gone up in some cases, a hundred, 150,000, even yourself in September, my guess is that the house value right now is significantly more than what you paid for it in September. That being said, you're not getting the house for another year, year and a half. And if the reverse starts to happen where some of the house values come down, then there's a risk. So buying from a builder has generally proved to be uh, very wise, uh, but we've never also experienced anything that we're going through today mm -hmm. and over the last few months. So the possibility is there. And again, you talked to a lot of people, they're nervous about the real estate values coming down. My personal opinion is I don't see it. I think that supply and demand always rule. And the bottom line is that there's not a lot of supply and lots of demand for housing. Mm -hmm. We are sitting on a record number of pre-approvals. And just because of that alone, uh, I believe that, you know, real estate values are still going to remain calm. It really is incredible. Many people are saying that Ottawa is just playing catch up to the big boys, to Vancouver and Toronto. Uh, is that what you think? Uh, I do believe that. I've always believed that Ottawa, from a real estate value standpoint, has always been a great place to buy a property. Uh, now we've caught up, I think. I don't think that we are... Um, you know, uh, I don't think there's a lot more room for, for this kind of price increase to continue. Uh, but I do but I do believe that, you know, as far as G7 countries, we were one of the cheapest capital cities to buy a property in. And yet, you know, we're one of the nicer cities. So um, I think I think what we're seeing now is where we're at. And I, I really st think that moving forward, we're going to start to see the increases be much, much smaller. Let's talk about first time. <clears throat> sorry, let's talk about first time home buyers, uh, Frank. This is something that certainly scares young people. Are they ever going to be able to own their own home? What would your advice be? It's tough. Like a single person trying to buy a home today, uh, whether they're first time home buyers or even someone who might have go gone through a breakup or just wanting to buy their own, it's extremely difficult. The rule of thumb is you qualify for five times your annual gross income for a mortgage, and then you add your down payment on top of that. But that's assuming you have no other debt. If you've got other debt, then that number could be reduced as well. So mm -hmm. when you're when a townhouse today is selling for six hundred thousand, that means somebody you know one person or two people have to be making at least one hundred twenty thousand to qualify. So really difficult for first time home buyers. You know, the advantages are there with taking money out of an RSP and you get the $4,000 land transfer tax rebate. But, you know, the 
can one person on an income of, you know, it used to be if, if you made 60 or 70,000, you'd be able to get into a house. At 60 or 70,000, you can't get into a house anymore. So mm -hmm. what we're seeing happen is a lot of friends are buying houses together where individually they can't do it. So friends are getting together. They're both renting. They're saying, let's just buy a house together. At least we'll get into the market. We'll build some equity. And maybe two or three or four years from now, we can start kind of going on our own. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Is this a good time to be looking for investment properties? Like, is this a good time to be purchasing uh, something and obviously renting to someone else? Difficult to find an investment property that cash flows based on the values of the homes today. So, you know, if you're getting a townhouse for 600000 number one, if you buy an investment property, you need to have a 20% down payment. So, you know, a $600,000 townhouse, now you've got a mortgage of 480000 On a mortgage of 480000 best case scenario, we can amortize it over 30 years. You're looking at mortgage payments of about $2,000. Mm -hmm. But then you've got property tax on top of that, insurance on top of that. You need to set some money aside for maintenance, possibly. But, you know, a townhouse, you might only get $2,100 or $2,200 a month in rent. So now your cost is about $2,600, 2700 mm -hmm. and you're getting $2,100, $2,200. So, you know, I used to say you buy an investment property, it's twofold. Number one, I mean, you try to get it to at least cash flow neutral, maybe a little bit positive, but cash flow neutral. But the second part is the appreciation of the value of the property. But if, we've, if we're gonna to start to slow down on the appreciation, then it may not make sense. So in other words, it's not for everyone. Now, what I've had clients do is buy properties in the outskirts, the Brockvilles, the Smiths Falls, the Perts, where you're getting properties that have two units and you're paying the same as you would pay a townhouse, but your rents are significantly more. So then that makes financial sense. So that's what we're starting to see some of the investors do buy properties on the outskirts and not in the core of the city because the core of the city doesn't make financial sense. It is a crazy market. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of those uh, those great uh, tips for us today. Frank Napolitano from Mortgage, Mortgage Brokers Ottawa. Thanks so much, Frank. Thanks, Sam, and please continue to support our local businesses and charities. I love that. Absolutely. We're on the same page. Thanks so much, Frank. I appreciate your time. Pleasure. When we come back, we're going to speak with Emma Anderson. She's a professor of classics and religious studies at the University of Ottawa. We are going to tackle uh, the very, very sad news coming out of Kamloops, B.C. About 215 children found in a grave. It is unspeakable. It's unfathomable that this has happened in this country. We know this was located, of course, at a residential school. We're going to talk uh, on the angle of the Catholic Church and residential schools. You will not want to miss this. We want you to stay with us here, of course. And a little bit later, we're going to be talking uh, to Kenny Rare. We're going to be talking a little hockey, a little football. You want to stay here. I don't know. You know, there's a big game tonight, Game 7. Of course, I'm going to be watching. I know you're going to be watching. If you're not going to be watching, I think you have to give up your Canadian passport. That's what I've heard. Uh, stay with us here on City News.
in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, May 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 14 degrees, and here's what's making news of this hour. The new Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario will be under the guidance of the outgoing chief, for almost a month before Kieran Moore takes over from David Williams. Legislation to approve this move being introduced at Queen's Park today. It appears the province has had a change of heart on tonight's Game 7 NHL game in Toronto. 550 fully vaccinated frontline workers are being invited to Scotiabank Place in Toronto to see the Canadians and the Maple Leafs battle in the deciding game of their NHL series. Suggestions made and initially rejected by the province. The minister in charge of sport, Lisa McLeod, though, making the announcement on Twitter just moments ago. Growing calls for a national day of mourning to honour the 215 children whose bodies were found buried on land that was a residential school in B.C. Right now, the country, the province and our city have all made the decision to fly flags at half-mast for an hour for each of those children. That half-mast salute will last for the next nine days. A shipment of 2.9 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine due to arrive in our country this week, and 500,000 doses of Moderna are due to arrive in a couple of shipments starting this week. City News Time, 931. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Thank you so much for joining us here on Rogers TV and City News. I'm Sam LaPrade filling in for Rob Snow. As you know, if you've been listening to us at all this morning, there is some tragic news out of Kamloops, BC, 215 bodies found in a grave and of course uh, this is at a residential school indigenous children that were ripped from their families and taken to these residential schools have been found it is absolutely a tragic day think about this for a second a graveyard at a school there was not a graveyard at my school was there a graveyard at your school this is an absolute dark day in this country we wanted to speak with emma anderson a professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa. Good morning, Emma. Good morning, Sam. Emma, it's been a tough weekend. There are no two ways about it. We know that there is uh, outrage. There is grief. Uh, it is unspeakable what we're learning about what's happened in Kamloops. When did you first learn the news, Emma? Just like all other Canadians, uh, through media outlets. But um, in some ways, we've been um, preparing for this sad day really since the uh, 2015 publication of the, uh, the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, because um, they were looking forward uh, to uh, this day, talking about missing children, talking about undocumented burials. And unfortunately, I think what we're seeing at Kamloops may be just the first in what are going to be a series of very unwelcome and very tragic revelations about these undocumented uh, child burials, possibly across Canada, not just in uh, British Columbia. Emma, remind us how many residential schools there are in this country, there were in this country. At the height of the residential school system, there were 130 residential schools, some of them very large. Kamloops was one of the biggest uh, at, the, at its height in the 1950s. 500 Indigenous students uh, attended Kamloops. Um, always the, the residential schools were kind of, um, at least in their modern incarnation, they go all the way back to the 17th century. A lot of people are unaware of that. Almost as soon as French missionaries arrived in what was then New France, they started uh, really setting up an earlier iteration of uh, the same kind of residential school philosophy of separate the youngsters, uh, some painfully young. Um, we know, unfortunately, from the graves that have just been uh, in the process of being excavated, uh, that some of these kids in Kamloops were as young as three years old. Um, back in the 17th century, this, the idea was the same. 
uh, separate the kids from their culture, from their families and their community, then they'll be more likely to embrace uh, European religion and uh, languages. Uh, but then, of course, in the 19th century and into the 20th century, this process accelerated and the schools became larger and larger. And unfortunately, with that process, um, the, the kinds of abuses to which Indigenous children were subjected only grew as well. Let's talk about the Catholic Church. Where do they uh, come into the picture? Well, um, it's important always to to keep in mind that a range of different churches, including Protestant uh, churches and the United Church of Canada, were also complicit in the residential school system. But Catholic Church uh, did run over 70% of residential schools, and they were a particularly attractive group for the federal government to ally themselves with because, in some ways, it was a money-saving operation. Um, they could simply delegate this responsibility for um, this indoctrination and, and forced assimilation to the Catholic Church, who, of course, would uh, had all these different kinds of missionary orders, uh, notably the, the same one uh, that founded the University of Ottawa, where I work, the Oblates of Mary Immaculate who would often um, partner with uh, different nuns, like the orders of uh, the Sisters of St. Anne or the Sisters of the Child Jesus, to uh, teach uh, kids in in residential schools. So the Catholic Church, yeah, like I said, uh, ran about 70% of these these, uh, assimilative uh, residential school institutions. And let's talk about the last school that was closed, Emma. When did that happen? Where was that? Well, shockingly, uh, residential schools uh, really didn't start to completely be shut until the 1970s, 80s, and even in some cases with the 1990s. Uh, in many cases, it's impossible to make kind of uh, over uh, generalizations because, as we even saw with Kamloops, it was often a kind of a staggered um, process. I think what makes Kamloops unique is is not just this this latest revelation, unfortunately, um, of the 215 uh, kids' graves that they've just discovered using this this special technology, but also the end of Kamloops is. Um, in some ways typical, in some ways unique. The fact that the school building is still standing there, um, I think has actually helped uh, the the First Nation uh, responsible for for finding these graves uh, to to have located the the cemetery. But sadly, um, as early as 1910, people were trying to alert the the federal government and the general public uh, about problems at the Kamloops School. 1910, we get uh, complaints that there's not enough money being allocated to properly feed children. 1918, in a routine inspection, there's a similar complaint made by the inspector. 1924, there's a major fire. 1927, there's another report about poor building construction leading to um, epidemic illness, uh, pneumonia, bronchitis, TB at the institution. And yet, still, the official records show only 51 deaths during the institutional history of Kamloops, whereas we now know the real total is is much higher. And this is concerning on so many levels. The number, uh, the young age of of many of these these kids, but also, most importantly, the fact that these are undocumented, uh, implying a kind of secrecy, a lack of transparency. Uh, A real priority has to be to find out the identity of each and every one of these young kids and how they died. Uh, this will be more difficult, of course, with the, uh, the, the passage of, of decades and the, the lack of adequate uh, written records about who these kids are and, and how they met their, their end. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question, Emma. You obviously study uh, religion. Is it hard to be Catholic today? Do you think people are waking up today really thinking about their faith and thinking about the, the and I'll use the word legacy, but not in a positive way, of the Catholic Church in this uh, tragedy? I think that the Catholic Church does have to take a long, hard look in the mirror um, about this, this tragic chapter in their history. But I would also say that uh, the religious mentality that led to the development of residential schools by Catholic, uh, the Catholic Church, but also through by the many Protestant churches, including the United Church of Canada, 
fortunately, is something that I think uh, we can safely sort of say is in our past. When we think about um, the major religious motivation to establish residential schools, it really was done uh, with a very foreign mentality to, to the kinds of values that we now hold as Canadians. Uh, in the 21st century, of course, we value cultural, religious, spiritual, linguistic diversity. Uh, we can't say the same, though, for people in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, and even into uh, the early 20th centuries, where in 1920 was when uh, residential schools became legally mandated, right? Um, that we had uh, Indigenous people were, in fact, forced um, with the, the threat of arrest if, if they didn't surrender their children uh, to these assimilative institutions. But the religious background, the religious basis of um, that allowed people to somehow argue this is ultimately in people's best interests, we're saving these children from hell, we're exposing these children to uh, superior European culture. Luckily, those attitudes, uh, I think, of, are all but extinct uh, or should be. Uh, in contemporary Canada. So uh, even though it's a, it's a horrifying stain on our history, this is not something that people would be able to do uh, over again uh, in, in the 21st century. Simply our, our cultural milieu, our, our values as Canadians would not permit this to, to happen again. Many people looked yesterday to see if uh, the Pope was going to say any words in his Sunday address, and he did not address it. Was that a mistake, do you think? Well, I think that um, people have been looking to the Catholic Church to provide some sort of uh, mea culpa for Canadian residential schools for a long time. Um, it is notable that some of the individual orders, such as the Oblates of Mary Immaculate and others, have uh, apologized for their own part, the Oblates, all the way back in uh, 1991. My own feeling, though, is that um, apologies rarely, if ever, provide the kind of practical leadership that's needed. Uh, I've noted that Justin Trudeau uh, said a lot of very beautiful things and, and seemingly heartfelt things about uh, the Kamloops discovery, but it's notable that the federal government is actually fighting attempts to uh, release more records about a different uh, school, St. Anne's Residential School in Fort Albany in our own province of Ontario, which is also an oblate institution. So. Uh, uh, while I think it might be comforting for many people if uh, the Pope was to come out and, and say something, I don't think there's any substitute for practical action. I mean, look at what happened with Kamloops. People have been making allegations uh, at least since 2008 that there were some sort of hidden burials on the Kamloops uh, residential school grounds, but they couldn't prove it without the use of this technology. And in many cases, uh, people that came forward were ridiculed and mocked, like Kevin Annette, uh, who had been uh, trying to get justice and trying to find uh, these hidden graves. It was the technology that allowed it to happen. Similarly, I think if, if the Roman Catholic Church really wants to do something to try to atone for or make up for uh, its role in residential schools, it should open its archives and it should encourage all people uh, who worked in any capacity in these residential schools who have any kind of knowledge of uh, these, these hidden burials to come forward to uh, police authorities in their province or to the RCMP uh, to give as much information as possible about that so that we can get the remains of these children home to their families and communities where they belong. Absolutely, because I think it's one thing to, you know, to lower flags and, and to do those things. And of course, that's all important in terms of, of ring, really bringing attention to the 215 lives that were lost. And, and sadly, we probably think there's more, obviously. Um, but, you know, that's not enough. I mean, we, we need to we need to see some action, like you said. What yeah. can every single Canadian do? What 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 are your thoughts on on what each and every one of us can do in, in light of this tragedy? 
Well, I think that uh, one thing I would really encourage people to do is to just become familiar with the, um, the recommendations and the call to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I think people are often um, a little bit intimidated because of um, how much information came out of the TRC, but their call for action is, is something that's addressed really to all Canadians. And interestingly, uh, call for action um, action items number 73, 74, uh, and 76 all had to do with this business of trying to find missing children, trying to uh, figure out where these these missing graves might be. Uh, so this has been on the books as an actionable item that people can uh, help with really since 2015 and the close of the TRC. Um, I think kind of pushing our, our local, provincial, and federal leaders for concrete and practical steps because I think, like you said, um, unfortunately in, the, in our own sort of internet age, it's easy for people to post things, it's easy for people to wear orange t-shirts, uh, but what we really need is um, forensic anthropologists to go and help uh, at Kamloops for uh, the Oblates of Mary Immaculate and all of their uh, feminine sister institutions that help with teaching to come forward with archival information, with their own memory. Uh, for survivors in BC and elsewhere to to um, go to local law enforcement with any information that they re- they re- might remember uh, about uh, seeing some of these uh, these children being buried or anything else that could help us lead to um, identification and and reunification of these tragically small skeletons with the people that love them. Em, I value your time so much, and I have learned so much from you today. I'm hoping we can call on you again. Oh, I'd be very, very happy to. I mean, unfortunately, this is only, uh, I think, the beginning of, of what we're going to learn about Kamloops. The, um, the chief, uh, Roseanne Casimir, has promised more detail um, in later in June uh, about this, this tragic incident. Thank you so much. Emma Amber Anderson professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. And each and every one of us, we have to take time to think about the 215 lives that were lost. It is tragic. We need to keep our eye on this moving forward and think about each and every one of those people and each and every one of those families. When we come back, we have lots for you. Stay with us here on City News. The food cupboard started about 25 years ago. Again, it was a very small operation in the basement of a church. Uh, And we have been expanding to the point where we needed to have a new facility. So in discussion with the the city of uh, Ottawa and Jan Harder, the local uh, representative here, uh, we came to this location, which is about 2,000 square feet located in the Walter Baker Centre. We've been here for about two years and it is much better. It gives us a much broader opportunity to serve our clients better. It's a fairly affluent community in Barhaven, so you wouldn't think that people would really need to have a food bank or a food cupboard. But people sometimes have a temporary loss of their job, uh, maybe new immigrants or refugees to the community. Maybe there's been an injury in the family or something like a pandemic that uh, causes uh, people to run short of food during their, their monthly requirements. So we uh, offer uh, any clients who come and live in our catchment area the opportunity to pick up an order of food every, every three, week, three or four weeks. The need varies from time to time. Uh, we have expanded our offering to include quite a few perishables, uh, eggs, milk, cheese, yogurt, vegetables, um, uh, fruit, uh, but people People, I think, know that we need cans of beans and stuff as well, too. One thing that we're, we're consistently short of sometimes is uh, personal hygiene products. You go to the grocery store, you buy your toothpaste and you buy your deodorant and shampoo there. Uh, people don't automatically think that to, to donate those kinds of things to a food cupboard. So we end up buying quite a few of those things from time to time. The pandemic has, has affected us like it has everybody. Initially, we had to stop the grocery store uh, food donations 
so that we didn't have any risk of contamination and, and to, to have a significant number of volunteer work to be done in our facility. We have a, a storefront, so it's like a mini grocery store where you take a cart and you go around and pick out the things that you want. That doesn't work during the pandemic to maintain social distancing and so on. So what we have now is our clients can come in one at a time, they make an appointment, they stand behind a line, and they direct our volunteer to, you know, I'd like Kellogg's Corn Flakes rather than Harvest Crunch, uh, to pick the, the food that they would like off the shelves according to the allocation, depending on the size of their family. And then they take it out, uh, load it into their vehicle or whatever, bring back the cart, we disinfect everything and prepare for the next plant. We are very blessed here in Barhaven. Uh, we're a totally volunteer organization. So if you give a, a dollar to us, it goes to purchasing food or to provide some service to our clients. No Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Sam LaPratt filling in for Rob Snow on this Monday, May 31st. You know what tomorrow is. Of course, it's June 1st, which means it's Pride Month. So we wanted to talk to Osmel Maines. Hi, Osmel. Hey, how are you? Good morning. I love chatting with you. Uh, Executive Director of Capital Pride. It's just around the corner. What have you got planned? Oh, my God. There's so many things. I, I know last year... Uh, we always speak, we spoke about uh, trying to dance on the streets this year, but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> due to the ongoing pandemic, we have to put that off for next year. But uh, this year we have so much programming that uh, able to be like um, in my I, I like to say chef's kiss. So that we are accommodating a lot of folks within uh, the national capital region. We have a programming for everyone. That's amazing. So walk us through, of course, uh, the whole month of June dedicated to Pride. Uh, mm -hmm. What can we find? What, what's good to get involved with? Uh, well, for us here at Pride, uh, we are still um, on our ongoing uh, programming in terms of trying to make the best events for, for folks here and the world for our August festival. But until then, what I like to tell folks is to get, in, get uh, involved in your community, especially with various uh, LGBTQ2S plus uh, organizations such as Kind Space, um, getting some work done by Wisdom to Action. Various folks uh, are still doing some great work. And so I, I, I would encourage folks to participate in, in events that they're doing. And at the same time, getting to learn more about the 2 LGBTQ community uh, and understanding where folks are coming from in terms of their lived experiences. I've thought a lot over the last uh, number of months, of course, we're sort of heading into about 16 months, I guess, of this uh, pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. about people that maybe were wanting to come out during this time and, and they may not have had uh, the, the support maybe within their, their nuclear family. They may right. not have had the, the supports of, of uh, you know, the community like they would have normally had. Uh, have you been hearing that, Osmel? Uh, so I do. Um, unfortunately, folks, folks do try to like uh, have that sense of community because um, in many cases, our own families are no, are those who are not able to accept us, but the folks that we choose as our families. And in many cases, due to the pandemic. Uh, a lot of folks are not able to get a support from other folks who are just uh, who, who lived the same experiences as they do. But at the same time, I want also to I want also, uh, also folks to understand is that coming out is is not something that needs to be rushed. Uh, in many cases, it's to be done when you're ready. And in many cases, is that though this you know pandemic is here and and though we have various resources that um, folks can access, it's always good to understand that you can come out when you feel uh, right, uh, when it's the right time for you. And so, in many cases, uh, just even continuing to learn more, uh, so getting information from at Max Ottawa, as I said before, Kind Space, and, and so forth, just to allow folks to kind of understand what is involved because in many cases a lot of folks think that okay well i'm i think i'm queer so i'm just going to come out but at the same time do it on your own time when you feel that you know it's right for you we've seen so many corporations really uh, support pride whether it's you know working it into their logo or they're mm -hmm. selling merchandise how important is that for the community to see that kind of support and for allies to to really support pride as well 
Well, for me, um, personally, I think, um, and for the community, I, probably I can speak on and saying that I would want to see more of these organizations continue to do that three, throughout the 365 days a year. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great that you're putting pride um, paraphernalia or pride colors within your logos, but uh, at the same time, we are also people who are just using, who are ha- accessing your services, and we should only be known as, you know, one, you know, once in a, once in a year. But at the same time, it's um, it, it's like a double-edged sword. Because I could say all that, and I could also say the fact that yes, it, it provides an acceptance to folks who really want to come out to understand there's folks within the community that are there for. But at the same time, I want to ensure that the folks are not just using that as a step up of getting, you know, the the, the pink money, as they would say, or the or the two S L G B T Q money, but uh, but as a sense of um, uh, compassion, a sense of support for those folks who are going through what they're going through, because in many cases, homes. Um, you're still not being accepted uh, for who you are. And so in many cases, I really hope that um, these corporations are not using this as just a, a theme for once a year, but something that they can actually continue for uh, years to come. And we know in August, you and I always chat in August, and we've talked yes. about dancing <laughs> together in August. Yes, so I'm still prob- waiting. So I know I'm, to do that. <laughs> I'm waiting too. Uh, we know that probably won't be this August. We'll be looking yes. towards 2022. But Capital Pride, we have about a minute. Talk to us about what you're planning for August. Sure. Uh, so this year we are going back online. We have a theme called We Still Demand or En Ege Encore. Uh, where we're going to celebrate the idea of the 1970, the 1971 We Demand protest that happened here in um, in Ottawa, and so just giving folks the understanding that we're still. Um, as a queer society, as a queer community, we're still fighting for the rights to have a voice. We are still fighting for trans folks to be recognized and, and to be understand. And we're, we're still fighting uh, to ensure that we have all the rights as queer folks within uh, Canada. And so we want to remind folks that this is what we are. Even though during a pandemic, it's still the same. We're still fighting for that space to just be ourselves. And as you, as you alluded to earlier, is that uh, allowing yourself to come out and, and, and feel free, like that space is no longer there because of what is going, what we're going through to the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So we're hoping as Capital Pride to provide a lot of programming that will excite folks, will ins- ensure that folks understand, well, it's Pride still, we may not be dancing on the streets, but we are still going to be providing the necessary tools and education and knowledge that's that is um, that is really and and fantastically needed in this community. It's always a good day when I get to chat with you. Happy <laughs> Pride, my friend. Happy Osmo Pride Mains from Capital Pride. Thank you so much. Bye. And we want to hear from you. We're going to open up the phone lines after the news. We want to talk about your reaction to the news from Kamloops 215 children, the grave site. It is absolutely tragic and the Indigenous community is absolutely grieving. We want to hear from you. We also want to talk about, are you having a hard time booking that second vaccine appointment today? We're hearing that some people might. We want to hear from you. Stay with us here on City News.
local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, May 31st. Good morning, I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 14 degrees, and here's what's making news right now. As flags fly at half-mast across much of our country, honoring the 215 children's remains found buried at a site of a former residential school in B.C., there are calls for more to be done. Some are asking for a national day of mourning for those 215 children. Emma Anderson is a professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the U of Ottawa and tells the Rob Snow Show with Sam LaPrade there are things that have to be done. While I think it might be comforting for many people if uh, the Pope was to come out and, and say something, I don't think there's any substitute for practical action. I mean, look at what happened with Kamloops. People have been making allegations uh, at least since 2008 that there were some sort of hidden barriers on the Kamloops uh, residential school grounds, but they couldn't prove it. And Anderson says complaints about that school in Kamloops actually started in the year 1910. Official records show 51 deaths at that school. We now know the actual number is much higher. City News Time 1001. Now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Plenty of sunshine for us today. The high near 24 degrees. Tonight clouds increase the low near 12 and tomorrow we start the month of June with sun and cloud chance of showers. Isolated thunderstorms 26. For today the high 24. And right now in both Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's 14 degrees. We are below 1,000 new cases of COVID-19 today. The province reporting 916 new cases, along with 13 more deaths. 50 of these new cases are in Ottawa, three of them in the eastern Ontario region. There is one new case in Renfrew and no new cases in Leeds, Grenville and Lanark region. Each health unit does release their own figures during the day. The positive case numbers in the province come from some 18,200 tests. Demand for dairy is up during the pandemic. Local farmers say homebound Ontarians have turned to baking in many cases. Peter Roeder tells City News his business has seen some ups and downs in the past year, but overall it's good news for farmers. From January of 2019 till January of 2021, we're actually talking probably up around 4 to 5% in consumption. He adds the pandemic has made things more difficult, like an increased cost for wheat and corn. Weather has been a bit finicky as well, with a little bit of rain and some recent frost. But Ruder says he is lucky to get some rain where others have had none. City News Time 1003, the PC government in Ontario tabling a motion today to replace Dr. David Williams as Chief Medical Officer of Health. Health Minister Christine Elliott says the job will go to Dr. Kieran Moore. He currently heads up the Kingston Area Public Health Unit and expected to take over as the top doctor in late June. There will be some fans at Game 7 of the Leafs Canadians NHL opening round series tonight. Minister in charge of sport for Ontario, Lisa McLeod, tweeting this morning, 550 fully vaccinated healthcare workers will be allowed in to see that game live tonight. Now, Montreal's home arena was allowed to have about 10% capacity for Game 6 back on Saturday night. That meant there were 2,500 people attending that game live. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. There is certainly lots to talk about today. I'm Sam LaPrade on City News. And of course, coming to you on Rogers TV. There is lots to talk about. We can talk about, of course, the devastating news out of Kamloops, B.C., 215 Indigenous children found at a grave site as a, at a residential school. Uh, if you want to talk about that this morning, certainly give us a call, 613-750-1310. And, of course, uh, many people are having a hard time this morning. We're seeing on Twitter a lot of people having a hard time booking that second vaccine for people 80 and over. I need to do that for my mom a little bit later, so I'm hoping that that's going to be an easy process, but we hear it's not. Uh, so we want to hear from you. Two very, very uh, different topics today, but certainly if there's something else you want to talk about, certainly give us a shout as well. 613-750-1310. 
When I saw the news on the weekend uh, about the 215 Indigenous children, I literally gasped. I could not believe it. Not that we weren't uh, expecting something like this at some point in our history, um, but it certainly uh, shocked me to my core. Uh, David Smith, you and I have talked a lot about that this morning. Uh, when did you hear the news? Well, I I started taking in the news when it broke on Thursday afternoon, Friday morning of last week. And it's it's one of those things where almost initially you, you read the headline and you think, well, that, that can't be true. Mm-hmm. They can't have found, that must be a, a total, right? Like we, we had to have known, they must have found an, an additional part of a burial ground. They must have... There's no way that that was an unmarked grave mm-hmm. with the remains of that many children in it. It's it, it it was the kind of headline that I honestly didn't look at in, in, in as much depth as I should have initially because I, I assumed that I knew the story already, that that would have been a continuation of some previous reporting. And it took me a couple minutes once I saw the, the reaction starting to come in to go back and really and read the the full text of the story, and I'm not proud of that, but yeah, I, I read a lot of news for for a living, of so course. some of these things that I, I skim that I shouldn't skim, and this was one of those times where I'd actually it was it was the next day, it was sort of midday on Friday when uh, when I started talking about it mm-hmm. with people like you with Rob, we talked about it a little bit trying to plan Monday's show when I sort of fully uh, realized and fully absorbed what had actually happened. And uh, it's it, my my heart breaks for for anybody who has firsthand experience with that trauma because it's it's one of those things that it, it's so difficult to have that wound open up again and to hear about things like that through the media. Absolutely, and I I think one of the the you know most poignant um, visuals that I saw were those those two hundred and fifteen little pairs of shoes. I I really. And that was a that was a very striking visual for me to see uh, those shoes representing each one of those children uh, literally ripped from their home. I mean, there is no other uh, nice way to say it. People, um, you know, have other terms for it, but I call it actually ripped from their homes. Indigenous children brought to residential schools. We know that the survivors of residential schools have been speaking about uh, this tragedy for for many, many years. And we heard earlier uh, from Emma Anderson, a professor at Ottawa U, this is really uh, centuries long. Uh, hearing this and hearing this in, in Canada, in this country, is definitely a very, very black day. Uh, we wanted to speak with a caller now. Go ahead, caller. Can I... Can I ask you to pronounce your name for me? Hello? Hi, can I ask you to pronounce your Hi. name for me? I want to I sure. get it correct. Sure, Kwaja. Kwaja, thank you so much for calling. Did you have some thoughts on the, uh, the discovery in Kamloops? Well, it's obviously very sad, but today I, just, I was off, so I wanted to talk about the reduction in SERB. Okay, so go I'm ahead. I'm concerned about, like, I work, my wife works, we haven't received a penny in, uh, in CERB. Uh, we work throughout the pandemic. But starting next month, they're reducing it to $1,200. Uh, my concern is how could we leave a family with $2,400 where at least 2000 of it goes into rent? Mm-hmm. Are they going to pay their bills or eat? Like, I live a comfortable life. I'm very fortunate. Many of my fellow Canadians don't. And I was very disappointed. I thought one of the uh, parties would just jump in and uh, get them to uh, keep the CERB at what it is for a while because the CRB right now, it, it should not be associated with COVID at all. A lot of businesses have closed. Where are those people going to go? Mm-hmm. It's so definitely a good point. Yeah, it's definitely a good point. And on the flip side of it, just, just you know, I'm devil's advocate today, right? So on the flip side of it, people are sort of saying, okay, like at some point we, we all, I mean, taxpayers for, for generations are going to pay for this. So at some point we have to start to pull back. Your thoughts are that it's too early though. It's way too early. Yes, of course, my tax money is going to pay for it. My kid's tax money is going to pay for it. But we are in Canada. We have to help our fellow Canadians, instead of like we could, there are areas we could cut. We come up with a $5 billion child care. That's an election budget. Mm-hmm. We need to take care of Canadians. We're, okay, these, the $5 billion they're willing to spend on, on child care, 
like if there's no job for these families, they, their kids are home, parents are home, so we really don't need that. Maybe in five years from now, our economy fully rebounds, then we can go back and and say, okay, now these people don't. Right now, our economy is not where we should be leaving vulnerable Canadians to pick between feeding their kids or paying bills. So are you thinking that, uh, because of course, you know, we probably are going into an election, so are you thinking pulling money back or on totally the it's a liberal, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an election budget to gain more, uh, more votes. Right, but of course it's going to, if we pull back on the CERB, uh, are we thinking, are your thoughts that the people that may be uh, affected by the CERB aren't the voters the Liberals are looking for? They're not. Unfortunately, they're the low-income people who really need it, and those are the ones who really don't vote most often. They don't have the time. They have to mm-hmm. choose between going to vote on a day or going to work to make money. Mm-hmm. Really, so we uh, need to help our fellow Canadians here. Yeah, I'm also. I'm disappointed. Nobody just jumped in from any uh, political party to support the uh, Liberals, force them to just keep it the way it is. Because we're going to need these families are going to need help. Well, we know that food banks are talking about being up, uh, you know, upwards of forty percent over 2019. So we know that uh, you know the help has got to come from somewhere. So really appreciate your call today. Some uh, some excellent points. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. If you have some thoughts today, whether you have some thoughts maybe on the Serb, like we just talked about, or maybe you're thinking about the families and the lives lost in Kamloops, BC, we'd love to hear from you. And of course, uh, are you trying to rebook uh, your second vaccine? Are you trying to to do that? Are you trying to do that for a loved one? I know uh, a lot of people over 80 have uh, their family trying to do that for them today. Are you having a hard time getting on? Is the system broken again today? Are we having that those challenges again today? We're hearing uh, from a number of people. I know uh, a writer for the Ottawa Citizen, Elizabeth Payne, was just tweeting out that she had a really easy time booking her first appointment for her dad, but the second appointment has been very difficult. Uh, we know that... Um, Obviously, lots of people are looking for that second dose. That's going to be really the thing that that allows this country to open uh, up. David, have you had your vaccine yet? No, I got my vaccine the the day that Ontario's reopening plan is uh, supposed to start on the 14th of June. Let's 14th of June is your big day. Mine that's, was. Uh, oh, that's two weeks from today. Oh, two Very weeks today. There okay. you go. I um I had mine on April the 23rd, and I went to Costco to have mine done. Ah, oh, they've got everything at Costco. They've got everything. Life saving vaccines, cheap I socks, I gallon tubs of mayonnaise. What can't you get at Costco? Yeah, exactly. So I went in there for uh for my vaccine. Vaccine. And I will be honest with you, I know you know I'm an emotional person. Yeah. There's no denying it. Yeah. But I, I got teared up and I wasn't the only one. There was a lot of people very emotional about getting their vaccine. You're not kind of that emotional guy, but do you think there's there's something about that? You'll always kind of remember that date? Oh, certainly. I, I think I'll always remember the, the email when I finally got confirmation of my first appointment, even then. And I didn't really expect to feel that way because I'm not really like that. But mm-hmm. when I actually got that confirmation number, they, like it did kind of feel like a weight was lifted off my shoulders. Mm-hmm. Both, you know, I'm going to get a vaccine. And also I got through this booking process and was ma- managed to get a shot. And I I really feel for the people who have a hard time getting these appointments. It was very easy for me. It was very easy for a lot of the people I speak to. But then some of the other people I speak to, it's been very, very difficult for them. Exactly. And it's really it's really been one of those things where, you know, you know, we ask about the weather and now I find everybody saying, so did you get your shot? It's become part of our vernacular. Well, there's no sports (laughs) to talk about. So this is what we talk about. Okay, there's a big game tonight. I'm sure you've heard game seven Leafs versus is the Habs you're going to be watching. I will try to watch some of it. My bedtime is pretty early these days, but uh, it was quite the show uh, on Saturday in, oh. in uh, Montreal. And I like that there were fans in the building. I find I found that, you know, the small number of fans didn't do as much for the energy level as I thought that they would. Mm-hmm. But it's tough when you're only at like, what, 10 percent capacity. Yeah. But uh, it'll be it'll be very nice to to see some frontline healthcare workers in the uh, in the stands for the game tonight, which is uh, a good move, I think, uh, for the, the Ford government to 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 cave on the uh, the the pressure that came out of that uh, that decision. I think that if you're fully vaccinated and you're a healthcare worker, it's it's time for you to go out and have some fun. So Absolutely. I think that's a great move. I'm, I'd love to know, and I haven't. I've obviously been on the air. I haven't been able to follow it as closely, maybe as you have. Have why 550? Was there a magic 
magic number regarding 550 frontline fully vaccinated people? Or was that just kind of a number that the Ford government chose? I don't think I don't I haven't seen any rationale for why that number. Maybe mm-hmm. that was as many tickets as they had left. Mm, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there's anything magic about mm-hmm. that 550 number. I, I suspect it was just that's how many seats they had left to fill. OK, before we go to commercial, Habs or Leafs, my friend? No comment. No comment. Okay. I'm not answering Okay, that I'm pulling Leafs. I'm now. saying Leafs. I say, I say Leafs and seven. I, I, as an Ottawa boy, I can't say the Leafs. I'm going to say the Habs. I just, I can't cheer for the Leafs. It's not, I, it, I'm biologically predisposed not to do that. Okay, our listeners can't see you, but you're literally like shrugging at that. Like that is just giving you a physical, a physical reaction that you just cannot say that Leafs. I don't like having to pick between either of them. I would (laughs) like to say the Senators. I agree. We all know how that went. 100%. When we come back, we're going to talk more about the vaccine. Stay with us here on City News. An old-fashioned, traditional grocery store. You're going to find a butcher, okay? You want a steak cut a certain way, you're going to get it. You know, there's flour piled in the warehouse. There's mixers on the floor. There's flour on the floor. Uh, The bakery is rented out to Frank Niccolo. It's him and his son come in at night. They mix the dough, they roll the dough, and they bake the dough. It's not the traditional... Uh, frozen and thaw and put it in the, in the bin, okay? It's made from scratch seven days a week. It's probably the only bakery left in Ottawa that does that. You know, then customer service, you know, we're, we're, we're big on that. The, uh, the cashiers, the, the deli, you're, you're not, if so, you ask for something, they're not gonna point, it's an aisle number seven, they're gonna bring you there, okay? If you have too much groceries out, we'll take it out to your car, you know what I mean? There's nothing we don't do for our customers. And we evolved around our customers. They would come in and say, you know, can you try getting me this? You know, can you get me this? So that's how we built the lineup we have now, okay? So we have a lot of unique items that someone that uh, uh, came over to, you know, live in Canada hasn't seen this particular product, but we sourced it and we have it for them that, you know, like something they used to have as a kid. We have a lot of those unique items, a lot. You know, uh, from Germ- like all over the world. And we source it through, you know, uh, distributors in Montreal and Toronto that bring in the product in bulk, and we piggyback off of them. Probably the uh, the largest European deli in Ottawa. We 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 sell lots because people buy lots. It's nothing really complicated about that. You know, we turn over a lot of product. You know, we package it properly. We buy, and we're always uh, consistent. You know, you're always going to buy, you know, cutty turkey breast. You know, San Daniel Mortadella you're always going to get the same brands. We don't flip back and forth to save 20 cents. It's always the same brands the last 29 years. Best sandwiches in town. It's simple. It starts off with fresh bread every day baked in the store. Anything that's left over goes to breadcrumbs. So you're getting a fresh bun every day that was baked probably four hours before you get here. Okay. Not only baked, made, like, you know, mix the flour, roll the dough, proof the bread, and bake the bread, okay? Then all the ingredients come right off the shelves. You know, your lettuce, your tomatoes, all your condiments, and they're cut up fresh in the deli. Not like the big, you know, corporate restaurant chains that your lettuce comes in shredded in the bag, you open it up and you throw it in the bin. You know, takes, you know, two or three days to get here from California, how long is it in the bag? The big difference is like making a sandwich at home and you don't have to do the work. It's really what the trick is and using the freshest ingredients possible. Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. I'm Sam LaPrade filling in for Rob Snow today. Of course, everyone is talking COVID. Everyone is talking vaccines. And of course, that means we want to talk to Dr. Doug Manuel. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. Epidemiologist and senior scientist with the Ottawa Hospital. Let's talk about the cases today. These are good numbers, aren't they? They're definitely good. Uh, we're we're um, we're going down everywhere. We're going down in Ottawa, uh, Ontario, and Canada. So that's definitely good news. So in tar- in Ontario, I see we have 916 cases today. Yeah. Where does that need to be for us to open up? In your opinion. Uh, 
It's a good question. In my opinion, I, I've been changing somewhat, but um, especially for Ottawa, we want it to be as low as we can go, really. Um, you know, I, I'm hoping, like my, my personal goal is that we're going to be like last summer where we had zeros on, on days. And if we can get that low, um, why I'm saying get that low is one, it's, it's just going to mean that we can open up a lot. And two, it means that we can transition. We're going to need to make a transition at some point to more like what I would call a cluster buster um, sort of um, uh, mode where we're, we're low, we're highly vaccinated, but we're still going to see these clusters, these outbreaks, including, you know, what we just see. You know, I, I think what we just saw in, in, in Ottawa last a uh, week or two weeks with a large outbreak in, in long-term care home. That happened. The people have been vaccinated, that they've been eligible for vaccination for months. So we've had a very high level of vaccination in our long-term care residents, not as high in our workers. And those outbreaks are still going to happen. We want to bust them as quickly as possible, find out the source and stop them, snap them out. So we're going to transition to that as we get higher. And the lower we are, the better that transition is going to be. For sure. And of course, Ottawa is seeing 50. Renfrew is sitting at one. Leeds, Grenville, Lanark is that zero you're looking for. And Eastern Ontario Health Unit sits at three. Test positivity is sitting at 4.3%. Uh, it, this is obviously good news, as we've said. Uh, you know, the vaccine rollout is such a big piece of this. How crucial is it that we get those second jabs in arms? It's 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 the focus right now. Um, you know, I love to see, see the kids back in school, but in terms of vaccination, um, it's our way out. I, 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 we don't want to count our chickens before they hatch. We want that's, that's what my mom would tell me in this situation. We want to get vaccinated and then open up as, um, and, and uh, not be too premature. But that's our way out. Um, the numbers I, I hear from my meetings with vaccination are starting to like I, I've been told that we're going to have these large numbers of vaccinations coming in, um, and we're starting to see that. So I think the likelihood of our dates being moved up and hearing that the government announced that. Um, is is true. That's what I'm I'm seeing, and that's going to be great. Now, I'm a parent of a 13 year old daughter, and we received an email from uh, Ottawa Public Health about the vaccinations. And you can help me out on the the terminology for grade seven and eight students. So they started to book those for for students. Ironically, my daughter was June the 12th. When the government opened up and indicated that uh, vaccines were going to be available for those 12 plus, they canceled all those appointments. Uh, are you aware of all this? No, all news to me. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I mean, just, I mean, once again, I'm, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but, but the reason that they canceled them, I'm assuming, because they don't know, they haven't tested those vaccines being given so close together. That's an assumption on my part. Once again, I'm not an epidemiologist at all, obviously, but that's just as a parent, uh, that was really interesting for me. Yeah, you know, broadly, um, you know, the vaccine rollout seems so messy, you know, and chasing down where you can get a vaccine in the last few months and these changing recommendations constantly. But I think if you step back from it, we this could be where we're going to shine. Like Canada, um, every country has had its great spots and its bad spots. But right now, overall, we're tracking to have higher first doses of any country. That may happen this week, mm-hmm. not the week this week, next week. Um, and if it holds up that Canada, you know, I, I think it's, it could be that can, as Canadians, we really value vaccinations overall. And we're going to we're trending really fantastic to have really high two dose coverage. You're, we're going to need it. Every country is going to need really high two dose coverage for the new variants. Um, and um, and so so it feels messy um, and it's going to continue to evolve. There's going to be uh, continue to be curveballs <laughs> coming at us. But. Um, from the broad strokes, it's looking really great. Let's talk about the variants. I heard another uh, doctor refer to them as the scariants uh, in terms yeah. of, you know, just uh, like you say, these curveballs being thrown at us. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Are, are, we, are we covered with this vaccine? Is, are we going to see people vaccinated, get COVID, a variant of it that isn't covered under this vaccine? Well, the... The new variant that we're worried about is India, and we're, I'm worried about it. Um, I, I remember when I was talking with Rob around Christmas, I said, you know, I was scared of the UK variant. And uh, the last time I talked to him, I said, I'm watching this one like a hawk. And for sure, this is going to create some some challenges. And 
we need this is another reason why we need to get very very low um because if we're not we're i, I think we're already in the race with the variants um a new race with with india so we're seeing um we're seeing countries like vietnam just be be overwhelmed not only india we're going to see more and more countries united kingdom which is our big one of our big barometers is um seeing now a new wave they're at the beginning of a new wave um and it's the and they're highly they're more vaccinated than we are Mm -hmm. uh they're about i would say a month and a half two months ahead of us in terms of vaccination so that's starting to get pretty close you know um the d117 we had eyes on it around christmas and and you know the science table was putting out the the alarms in you know February we need to get down, so so you know we're gonna this week we're gonna start seeing greater clarity on the models uh, for um, for how how soon it's gonna cause us a lot of pressure in Ontario and Canada and Ottawa, um, but um, if we get that second dose you're protected, mm-hmm. but the first dose will not be enough. We have about a minute left. Are we going to be seeing vaccines in children 12 and younger in 2021? Uh, good question. I have, I, I, I presume so, but I don't have enough to really get good guidance on that. Mm-hmm. You know, the math about how, you know, should younger children um, be vaccinated, it's different. You know, you know, um, as you get younger, you have less symptoms. So, you're doing it less for yourself if you're a kid. You're doing it more for your family and your community. Mm-hmm. So that's a bit of a different discussion. Um, even, you know, when we're talking to teens, you know, um, it's a bit of a different discussion. Um, and so as we get younger and younger, you know, I, um, you know, the guidance is going to evolve. Always appreciate your time. I know you're so busy. Thank you so much, Dr. Doug Manuel, epidemiologist and senior scientist with the Ottawa Hospital. Thank you. Okay, thank you. When we come back, we're going to speak with Becca Atkinson. She is host of a podcast called The Shameless Alcoholic. This is going to be a story you will not want to miss. Stay with us here on City News. in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, May 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 16 degrees. In Smith Falls, it's 15. And here's what's making news this hour. Province reporting 916 new cases of COVID-19 today, along with 13 deaths. 
50 of these new cases are in Ottawa, three in the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. There is one new case in Renfrew and zero in Leeds, Grenville, Lanark. The case count comes from just over 18,200 tests that were completed. A month-long transition period will take place through most of June for the top medical officer of health in Ontario. Kieran Moore, who was with the Kingston Public Health Unit, is moving into the provincial role once that passes Queen's Park. He will learn the role alongside the current top doctor, David Williams, until his retirement. That is slated for June 25th. Flags are flying at half-mast at municipal, provincial, territorial and federal buildings right across Canada today. But there are also calls to do more to honour the 215 children whose remains were found at a former residential school in B.C. There are calls for governments to use ground-penetrating radar to find similar grave sites if there are any more at the schools that were across our country. First Nations teacher Rick Joe says the discovery of remains is a triggering event for students who regularly learn about the history of wrongs against Indigenous people. City News Time at 1031. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Rob Snow Show. I'm filling in today. I'm Sam LaPrade. This pandemic has so many different angles to it. Of course, the loss of life. Uh, I mean, we could go on forever. One that hasn't been talked a lot about is alcohol, alcoholism and the pandemic. We wanted to speak with Becca Atkinson. Hi, Becca. Hi, how are you? Good. Becca, you have a podcast called The Shameless Alcoholic. Uh, the Unashamed Alcoholic. The Unashamed. I'm sorry, Unashamed. <laughs> the Unashamed uh, Alcoholic. And this is uh, a very important uh, topic today for me because you and I spoke on the weekend. I've been following your story. Let's start with your story. Where does your story with alcohol begin? Oh, well, I think the origins kind of go back to as a teenager, um, you know, kind of typical teenager behavior, um, partying in the 20s and then becoming an adult, uh, you know, realizing that you got a lot more freedom and, you, you know, this is what adults do. This is what everyone does. And you, you drink and, um, you know, that's when I think I started to notice that I my drank differently than other people is sort of my my 20s and into my into my 30s. But definitely started out um, as a teenager. But, you know, it's hard to differentiate your drinking from other people's at, at that time. Absolutely. I think that's uh, a really good point, because I think when we think about alcoholism and the pandemic, we think about the fact that, and, and many people have sort of joked about it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I can't do anything, so it's another bottle of wine for mummy tonight. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, people are, are sort of making fun of it, but I think underlining there's something really serious happening. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me and said, I found that I've been drinking more the last year, you know, because you're home, uh, it's the days become blurred between work and the end of the day or lunchtime, you know, having a, a beer or whatever at lunch, the kids are around. I mean, uh, it, there's just been a slew of reasons or rationalization, right, for, for how it's, you know, this is what you, know, you can use to cope. Um, but absolutely, there's been an increase in substance use um, to, in, or, in, in the last year in order to get through these trying times. Mm -hmm. I think we just have to think about going back to May, uh, sorry, March and, and April of 2020. You know, there was not a car to be seen, but you would see lineups at the LCBO. And that always kind mm -hmm. of, you know, shocked me that, you know, people are willing to sort of do that uh, as opposed to even, you know, they were ordering their groceries, but yet they were going to the LCBO. It was just kind of a very a strange dichotomy me for me um walk me through when you realized that you uh, you did as you said drank differently than mm -hmm. than maybe others and what that meant in terms of your own life well so i you know i started when i first 
I uh, graduated from Carleton and and uh, started living with you know a number of roommates in Ottawa in my 20s. I started drinking every day um, because I was like, this is what adults do. You have your you know I've got a job now. This is you come home and you have a drink. And I noticed my roommates weren't doing that. And I thought, well, that's strange. Like guys, don't you know we can drink whenever we want now? And mm-hmm. I remember thinking like, why wouldn't you? Why aren't they? And so that was really one of the first times I was like, ha, okay. And that didn't stop me, of course. And then um, as I got older, the partying subsided, but the drinking, I wouldn't say, you know, I wasn't blacking out every night. I wasn't getting drunk or throwing up every night, but I was drinking every day. Uh, not before work, not at lunch. None of these things, quote unquote, you think an alcoholic does. Um but really, when I had kids, uh, it had been bothering me for a few years, the amount I was drinking and how I had to drink every day. It was the priority. It was all I thought about, all I planned around, all this stuff. Um, again, not necessarily quantity. It's this time I was spent thinking about it. And so that had been sort of gnawing at me for a few years leading up to my early 30s. And then I had kids and suddenly, okay, you know, these are supposed to be the priority, but now it's competing with drinking. So that's when I, I just couldn't handle it. And I remember waking up in 2017 after my grandmother's funeral, so hungover, you know, as one is after a funeral. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I can't live like this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And that was really the, so that was June 2017. That was the moment I knew like I had to stop and uh, it took me another month but I stopped in July of 2017. Talking about being a mom and an alcoholic talking Uh about you know drinking after your grandma's funeral that's brave stuff and Becca there's no two ways about it I mean those are conversations that probably you never thought you'd have on radio. (laughs) No I mean (laughs) I I I had a really hard time saying the word alcoholic for uh, even in AA meetings, I thought, like, I'll just say it because, you know, ever you have to and whatever, but I'm not an alcoholic. I'm, I'm in an AA meeting going, I'm not an alcoholic, you know, right. but it, it's really hard to say that word at first. And that's why I started the podcast because like, you know, we've got to be able to say this word more easily. And, you know, I don't want to be brave. I just want this to be part of a normal conversation. Like I want it to just be something we can talk about. And, you know, it, it took a long time for me to be able to just comfortably say that word myself. It's still strange to be, to say, you know, my name is Becca and I'm an alcoholic because it's a word we just don't talk about freely and openly, right? It certainly isn't. And I think it should change. I mean, to be uh-huh. honest with you, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about any substance abuse, whether that be drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, I mean, food, uh-huh. I mean, the, you know, the list goes on. I think, uh, you know, and, I, and you and I had a conversation the other day and I think, you know, it's really important to say, I think everyone's got something and, right. and it can be, you know, uh, on differing degrees. But I think this pandemic has really shone a light, particularly on the alcohol side and potentially uh-huh. even the drug side in terms of, you know, not really having to show up at the office and people can't smell it on you. And, you know, yeah. all of those types of things. Uh, Becca, tell me if you have somebody, if one of our listeners is listening right now and they go, I actually have a problem. What do they do next? Well, you know, I mean, first of all, anyone can reach out to me. I'm happy to chat with anyone who wants to chat. You can find me on Twitter at Unashamed ALC, or you can Google the Unashamed Alcoholic Podcast. You can email me through the site. I'm happy to talk to anyone who is worried about that. Just because you're worried about your consumption doesn't make you an alcoholic either. And I think there's a misunderstanding around that too. You can just be doing something too much because it's become too easy to do, especially in the last year. Um, The other, you know, talk to anyone really. It's, you know, we build it up in our heads that we're going to be judged for saying something or we're worried about something or whatever and I can tell you that all the times I confided in people about this and I should have done it a lot sooner was the the reaction was supportive and understanding and helpful no one ever went like oh ew you know I can't talk to you anymore they were Mm -hmm. it was concern right so talk to someone the other thing is if you're concerned about it you know write a journal for a week of why you're drinking when you know what you were feeling what you were trying to accomplish with the alcohol, you know, did it help? That sort of thing. Keep track of, of you know, when you're drinking and why for a week. And then look at, back at that and see if it, you know, do you feel any different afterwards? Did it make any change? That sort of thing. And again, um, you know, I, I can't say it enough because I didn't do it for so many years. I worried about it in silence. I didn't talk to someone. So I would always say talk to someone, someone about it. At the appropriate time, Becca, will you talk to your children about your journey? You know, I, for a long time, was just like, I'll talk to them when they're older, I'll talk to them when they're older. And then I just thought, you know, like, I keep telling people I'm really proud of 
who I've become and who I am now. And, you know, why am I not telling them this? And they found my chips that, you know, you get it, you know, AA and every celebration. I've just kind of brushed off and said, oh, they're, they're, you know, mommy's special treasures, you know. And then I thought, you know what, they're seven and nine. They're old enough to, they know what beer is. They don't, they'll never remember me drunk, but they know what beer and alcohol is. And I just thought, I, I told them the other day, uh, you know, I, I would, did something um, through the Canada School of Public Service, and I was really proud of it. And I wanted to share that with them because why shouldn't I be able to? And, you know, they're fairly nonplussed about it, but also want me to start a YouTube channel so <laughs> they can get famous. So, right. you know, it's the, you know the, the kid mentality. But I just thought if the less big deal I make about this for them, the more normal it will be. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I'm going to take that opportunity and tell them when they're younger. We're speaking with Becca Atkinson, host of The Unashamed Alcoholic. Becca, let me ask you this. When you think back to maybe being drunk with, you know, when you had your children and, and all of those types of things, from what I understand, and I have a bit of uh, my own history, when I think back to any addiction, I think part of it is how we can actually forgive ourselves. Mm -hmm. Has that been a journey for you? Yeah, it feels kind of like a different lifetime ago when I look back at some of the things I did or said. And, you know, a part of it is, um, you know, part of in, a, in any recovery program is making amends. So that's how you address what those certain things you might have done. So um, I can't do everything, you know, that I've every DJ I've bothered or you know someone someone who I've embarrassed myself in front of or said something awful to like I can't go back to all of them but I have been able to make my amends um to the people in my life uh who who matter the most uh so you know I hadn't spoken to my sister in three years uh before I got sober because in my mind it was her fault when I got sober I realized it was mine so I was able to make those amends and now we are you know have a great relationship again so you know it's that's part of going back and addressing those things that you did I can't change what I did and again I look back and go I probably wouldn't because it's made me who I am today. Even with the alcoholism, um, I'm grateful now to be an alcoholic because it's made me who I am today. I'm a much better person now, sober, than I ever was when I was drinking. Mm -hmm. We often hear when it comes to any sort of addiction, one day at a time, one mm -hmm. minute at a time, sometimes one hour at a time, one second at a time. How does that apply to you, Becca? Uh, well, you know, especially in the last year with the stress of school in and out and, you know, I've been through a separation and soon a divorce and moving twice, you know, it's taking those moments that usually you would find comfort in what, you know, quote unquote coping and relief or whatever that alcohol would provide and you go, I'm going to play the tape to the end and see that that's actually not going to help. It's not going to get me anywhere. Um, so, you know, you, you and, and you know, what I've learned through conversations with the podcast is that, you know, I have almost four years sober. That's great. There's people who have 30 years sober and they've relapsed. There's no safe zone. So to get confident and start putting your recovery by the wayside, you go run the risk of uh, drinking again. So it's got to be a priority. It absolutely has to be your number one priority from what yeah. I understand. When I think about uh, this pandemic and, you know, we've seen surgeries canceled, we've seen, you know, lots of different sort of um, uh, things surrounding the pandemic that will be affected. Do you think we're going to come out of this pandemic with people saying, you know, I have a problem, where can I get help? Because a lot of people may not realize that a lot of the meetings for uh, things like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, are actually virtual now. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that there, there's actually a meme where there's a uh, on online now where there's like a stadium full of people and it says AA meeting after, after the pandemic mm -hmm. it's full of people. And I think that's it's there's a, some humor there, but I think there's some truth to that because because I think it's bringing to light maybe things that um, people didn't address before because life was just busy and whatever. And now you've had just time to think and sit and think, OK, maybe this isn't something I, I want to be doing. And again, you know, drinking a lot doesn't 
mean you're an alcoholic either. It could just mean you need help stopping. And there's lots of different ways. What has been great is for the last year, AA and you know all recovery programs have been online. So I've been able to drop into ones in the UK, in Minnesota. You know, it's been super fun to be able to meet different uh, people around the world who are just like, just like me. Um, but I have a home one here in Ottawa, and it's been on Zoom the whole time. And it's fantastic. And actually, if people are worried right now and want to kind of dip their toe in that, it's probably a lot easier because you don't have to show your face. You can turn the camera off. Um, you know, you can just sit and listen to other people's stories. There are, for for me, I'm most comfortable with an all women's one. So I have two all women ones I go to. Again, if anyone's interested in this information, I can help them uh, find that if they reach out to me. So, um, you know, there it's actually been kind of a blessing to be able to have those online um, uh, meetings now. I don't think that'll change because it's become so much more accessible Mm -hmm. and less and less intimidating to go to your first one. Becca Atkinson, I am so grateful for you and so grateful for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Becca Atkinson, you can find her by searching The Unashamed Alcoholic, a great podcast there. Uh, We really appreciate her time today. When we come back, let's talk a little rapid rapid test uh, when it comes to small business here in Ottawa. Stay with us here on City News. It's a space that needs to be lived in. It's a space that people... You know, have to have an experience of more than just art on the walls, I think. You know, yes, the art on the walls is fun, and it's fun to walk around and see all the beautiful things, and, and, and the way Dominic and Edith have curated the gallery is certainly uh, something worth seeing. But, uh, yeah, coming by and asking questions, again, to Dominic's point of view is, you know, interrupt him, ask questions. Uh, you know, I'm here on most of the days, too. We have Luce that comes in, Nancy that comes in. So, yeah, we have quite a few opportunities for people to come in and, you know, uh, see the process and of course ask a few questions. It's a great space. Uh, basically the one event that we do do or we did do <laughs> is the um, is the jazz shows, the jazz and blues shows and I think the weird thing to let you know is that the acoustics in here are really amazing. Uh, I think that was the first thing that blew me away when, when we started doing shows or when I was part uh, helping out with the shows. Um, and uh, the other part of the business too is we do rent it out for special occasions too so a few weddings, uh, birthday parties, uh, product launches, that kind of thing. So they're also a lot of fun. We do have one artist that's that's from the States, but uh, yeah, not, of the 30 odd artists, uh, the rest are from either Quebec, Ontario, and one uh, beautiful woman from BC. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely part of the philosophy to, to maintain and uh, canvas and show uh, the beauty that we have in our backyard. You have the very, very strong personalities in, in Edith and Dominic, of course. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see how that actually balances out in the rest of the gallery. Um, without necessarily being, you know, um, an objective, uh, we basically have half female artists and half male artists in this gallery. Uh, but it, I can't say it's anything more than choosing the best people, you know, and that's just the way it is. And I love that. I think it, it's great. You know, we've, you go through here and you're like, wow, it's all pretty cool. And yep, you know, it's half are women and half are men. It's cool. Like everyone else, we didn't know what to think, right? Uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's overwhelming at first. You just know that things are closed. Um, and now you're trying to figure out what you do during that, that downtime, which I think everyone did. And I think it's a, in March, the, the, the first close, the, the first shutdown, uh, it was a lot of actually recuperating and resting and, 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 and not worrying too much on the spot. Um, you know, it's, it, running a gallery is a bit like running a marathon with sprints. Um, so there comes a time where, yeah, it's actually nice to just take a break. Uh, and then you wake up and realize that, okay, now it's time to, uh, to wake up and deal with this new reality. From my perspective anyways, I, I, I think a gallery can be overwhelming and I like to make it fun. So you're gonna come in, I'll ask you questions. I might even joke around with you. You know, the most people come here, they're not really gonna buy art, but they could have a fun time and talk about it, right? Uh, and one of the things the gallery does offer is for, you know, for local um, purchases, we'll be happy to drive it to your house and hang it for you. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Sam LaPrad filling in for Rob Snow. Have you heard about the rapid test program? Well, if you haven't, we wanted to speak with Sonia Shorey. Hi, Sonia. 
Hello, Sam. How are you? I'm good, of course. VP of Strategy, Marketing and Communication at Invest Ottawa. You have certainly been very, very busy. It's been an incredibly busy time, uh, a challenging time for so many uh, that have been impacted by the pandemic, but a lot of opportunity, a lot of learnings and a lot of resilience. So we are set for the future, Sam. So let's walk through. Last week was a very busy week for you. Um, I was thrilled to join you uh, and your uh, team, of course, last week to talk about the digital mainstream. Let's just touch on that first for a second. Uh, Walk us through that program. What is it for those that may not be familiar? Digital Main Street helps all of our independent locally owned businesses get online, get selling and generating revenue quickly, no matter what the economic climate. So if you need a new e-commerce website, social media, you need to know how to target that online market. You might have never done it before. We've got teams of people that are dedicated to helping you do just that for free. We also have events and coaching and counseling available to help people get set up for success for the long term because these websites, all of these tools, they are going to propel these businesses far beyond the pandemic and just create alternate streams of revenue. We've supported 1,570 businesses spanning hospitality, retail, trades, and services since the start of the program last August, which is just incredible. It really is incredible. I know you've got a lot of ambassadors that have helped you with that program, and I love the name of it. Digital Main Street really gives us that, that feeling of community, and it really has come together like a community. It truly has. The ambassador program and all of the business owners, many of whom are ambassadors for this program directly, shows this is for the community, with the community. People, business owners from every corner of our city, every walk of life, and right across eastern Ontario, we've had the privilege of working with and supporting. We just got off our Asian Heritage Month event, which brought together incredible speakers from Chinatown and right across our Asian business community to inspire and come together as a means for support. It was just incredible to be there. So many opportunities. So many opportunities, absolutely. And I love, I heard somebody that was working uh, with your team in terms of the Digital Main Street, and they had about 150 products. But the team worked with them to realize they were really only selling 20 products, and they actually made more money. I love that. I thought that was brilliant. We've seen a direct impact when businesses get online and they've chosen the right approach, the right social media and structured their website and their business model in the right way. They're seeing genuine economic impact very quickly. Sales boost, new markets, new customers they've never touched before. For us as an economic development agency, that's tremendously exciting. And again, we're looking at the long run. There will be opportunities to generate revenue that exceed their wildest expectations um, beyond the bricks and mortar opportunity they previously pursued. I'm sure after very busy days when you finally, finally fall asleep at night, your dreams are full (laughs) of rapid tests. Talk to me about those. I know it's been uh, a really big project. Uh, Walk us through how this is going to impact those small and medium businesses. Well, I first want to give a huge shout out to Su Ling Ching, President and CEO, and the entire Ottawa Board of Trade team. It is their leadership that is bringing this incredible initiative to bear with members of our community, including the commissioners, the Rotary Club, and of course, um, we're privileged to be engaged as Invest Ottawa and Bayview Yards donating our facility to support the distribution of these free rapid test kits. Uh, This opportunity is for businesses to come and very safely schedule their 15-minute appointment to pick up their test kits so that they have two weeks worth of test supply to ensure any employees who are on site have that screening tool available to be able to identify whether or not they are asymptomatic. A positive test enables the employee to leave immediately and go right to Ottawa Public Health to validate and determine those next steps. Um, And we've been sold out. So we were sold out on our launch day at Bayview, which means 80 businesses picked up 1,200 individual rapid testing kits and they were distributed by volunteers to businesses that have between two and 150 employees. If businesses are in excess of 150, they work directly with the province. We're sold out again today, Sam. Like, it's amazing. And it's, you know, a tool in the arsenal, another tool in the arsenal alongside masks, social distancing, hand washing, all those other important protocols. And of course, a big tool has been communication. And let's, you know, not sugarcoat it. It has been very confusing for certainly the public. And my mom and I had a conversation. She's like, when does stuff open up? I'm like, I actually don't know. (laughs) Like, it's just changing all the time. How frustrating has this been for small and medium businesses? Well, corporate, uh, corporate Canada altogether. I think everyone has struggled just to keep the pace and better understand exactly what each protocol and each step means for them. 
everyone wants to stay safe, keep our, our employees safe, our community safe. Um, and it's really been um, a, a key role has been to keep up with all of the news and try and put into context uh, all the different programs, services and protocols. Um, we, together with COBIA, the BIAs, the Ottawa Board of Trade, um, have really worked hard to come together. And that's a silver lining, I think, in this pandemic. We are collaborating more closely than ever to try and communicate and put all of those protocols into context and more important help them through those times so that as they're making changes, as they're pivoting and no business <laughs> stayed static, that's mm-hmm. for sure, during this very challenging, uh, unprecedented period, trying to help them make the right investments at the right times through things such as the Digital Main Street program, putting the rapid testing program to work for them and continuing to grow and generate revenue so our economy stays whole. For sure. I mean, I think back to, you know, to March of 2020, April of 2020, you know, as uh, the, you know, someone that's in charge of marketing and communication for Invest Ottawa, entrepreneurs were very, very nervous. Are you seeing, you know, people sort of get a little bit more comfortable maybe sharing their ideas and and thinking about I keep talking about, as you know, last week, talking about the roaring 2020s. Right. I mean, we're we're hoping and, and praying for for really strong economic recovery. Um, are you seeing uh, the entrepreneurs feeling the same way? I do truly see a resilience and a commitment and a drive and a passion that um, I think is almost startling even to me. I've always known our startups and our scale-ups are really passionate. Um, They have rallied, and I think that we see the light on the horizon with the incredible rate of vaccines and the acceleration of those steps, along with other many positive signals surrounding the pandemic, the numbers coming down. We believe that we are well positioned and you do see growth. So just to highlight a couple of the tech entrepreneur success stories, Ascent Compliance positioned to maybe become the next unicorn, you know, generating a hundred billion supply chain data management company right here out of Ottawa. Go for coming forward with really novel first and last mile delivery has grown leaps and bounds 1200% from February to December, 2020. Rewind, an amazing company that backs up cloud-based data for the likes of Shopify has grown leaps and bounds as well and acquired a company uh, in Germany and field effect in cybersecurity, you know, doubling its headcount and its revenues over the last year. All this during this challenging pandemic wow. period. They're resilient. And those are just a handful of the success stories and the companies we're privileged to, to, to collaborate with and support during this time. Well, and I think your website's brilliant. Uh, I really encourage everyone, if you're thinking about going into business, there's a really cleanly laid out there exactly uh, what avenue you can take with Invest Ottawa. Sonia Shorey, always a pleasure, VP of Strategy, Marketing and Communication with Invest Ottawa. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Sam. When we come back, we're going to speak with the one and only Jeffrey Johnson, of course, at the Kingston Wig Standard. Conversations with Jeffrey are always enlightening, so we're going to talk to him about international affairs. And a little bit later in the show, we're going to speak with David Sally, of course, editor of the Ottawa Business Journal. Uh, to, to Sonia's point, business in many ways is starting to boom here in Ottawa. We're seeing a lot of different uh, um, exciting stories. One that I really hope to talk to him about, which is what's happened with Saunders Farms and the Flying Canoe Cider Company. So we're going to talk to him a little bit later. So stay with us here, of course, on Rogers TV and City News. I'm Sam LaPrade.
local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, May 31st. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 16 degrees in Smith Falls, 15. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Calls for a national day of mourning are growing as flags fly at half-mast across much of the country to honor 215 children whose remains were found buried at the site of a former Catholic-run residential school in B.C. Emma Anderson is a professor in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa. She tells the Rob Snow Show with Sam LaPrade there are things that have to be done. While I think it might be comforting for many people if uh, the Pope was to come out and, and say something, I don't think there's any substitute for practical action. I mean, look at what happened with Kamloops. People have been making allegations uh, at least since 2008 that there were some sort of hidden burials on the Kamloops uh, residential school grounds, but they couldn't prove it. Now, Anderson says complaints about the Kamloops school in particular started in the year 1910. Officially, records show 51 deaths at that school. We now know the actual number is much higher. City News Time, 1101, and now the forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. Plenty of sunshine for us today, the high near 24 degrees. Tonight, clouds increase the low near 12, and tomorrow we start the month of June with sun and cloud chance of showers, isolated thunderstorms, 26. For today, the high, 24. And right now in Ottawa, 16 degrees, and in Smith Falls, it's 15. The housing market has been hectic over the past year, and a mortgage broker says that's continuing, but it's also starting to shift. Frank Napolitano tells City News the increase in home prices should start leveling off as Ottawa catches up with Toronto and Vancouver, and that's leading investors to branch out. What I've had clients do is buy properties in the outskirts, the Brockvilles, the Smiths Falls, the Perts, where you're getting properties that have two units and you're paying the same as you would pay a townhouse, but your rents are significantly more. Now, Napolitano of Mortgage Brokers Ottawa says it is no longer making total financial sense to buy a rental property in the city of Ottawa. We've been stuck at home for a year and a local dairy farmer says his business has actually increased due to residents trying some new things. People are baking more and uh, they need great Canadian milk to, to make those delicious dishes. So our consumption is actually up. It's been rising through the whole pandemic. Now, Peter Reuter from Nepean tells City News his business has grown about 5% above the pre-pandemic level. There are some struggles, though, because rising prices on things like corn and wheat have hit the wallet, while a lack of rain and some recent frost also hurt some crops across the region, although he says he has been pretty lucky. City News Time, 1103. Ontario has given the green light for 550 fully vaccinated health care workers to attend tonight's NHL Game 7 between the Maple Leafs and the Canadians. Premier Doug Ford's office says the frontline workers have received both doses of a COVID-19 vaccine and will go through screening and other precautionary measures. The province says the crowd will be well below capacity for Scotiabank Arena. Some 2,500 people were in the stands in Montreal when the two teams met on Saturday. That was the first crowd for a game in Canada this year. The Canadians have won two consecutive overtime games to set the stage for Game 7. Adam Burns, The Canadian Press, Toronto. And our post-pandemic recovery in the economy seems to be gaining a little more steam now. A Paris-based think tank predicts Canada's economy will grow by 6.1% this year. That prediction up from its previous forecast earlier this year of 47 I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. I'm filling in for Rob Snow today. I'm Sam LaPrade. So happy to be with you. We've certainly talked about lots of different topics today. A little bit later in the show, we're going to talk business. And of course, we do that with uh, Dave Sally, uh, editor of the Ottawa Business Journal. We're also going to touch base with the infamous... Kenny Vrare. We're going to talk to him about a little football and, you know, of course, a little hockey. Of course, he is the former Ottawa Rough Riders receiver and just an overall great guy. And a little bit later as well, we're going to be speaking with Kevin Cohane, president and CEO of the Chio Foundation. 
This is a very important week for them, so we'll definitely want to hear all about it from Kevin. First up, Jeffrey Johnson, how are you? Good morning, Sam. Great to speak with you, and I'm fine. I hope you are doing well, too. Thank you so much. I always enjoy our talks. I always uh, leave our interviews enlightened and and just a little bit smarter uh, because you (laughs) always uh, share some interesting aspects of international affairs, of course, from the Kingston Whig Standard. How's everything in Kingston? Uh, Everything's uh, great. Uh, Kingston, actually, this past week, um, had a couple of days where there were zero COVID cases, and that's uh, due in large uh, part to the the leadership of Dr. Kieran Moore, the the local public health officer, and it was just announced over the weekend that he's actually going to be taking over for Dr. David Williams as Ontario's chief medical health officer. So I think that's great news for the province, a loss for Kingston. Mm -hmm. We're sorry to see him go, Mm -hmm. but but uh, Ontario's in great hands with Dr. Kieran Muir. I was wondering if you were sort of thinking it was bittersweet, uh, the fact that the whole province gets him, but uh, but missing him, of course, in the Kingston area for sure. He's a fantastic communicator. Uh, he's really up on the data. And the, the thing about Dr. Moore is he tells it like it is, but he is very compassionate. And he tells you stuff in such a way that makes you want to do better. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, because, for example, there was a, an outbreak at a construction site. And Kingston had its largest spike uh, in April throughout the entire pandemic due to this uh, construction outbreak and the variants. And he said Kingston was at the, you know, the greatest danger it, it had been throughout the entire pandemic. But uh, he guided the uh, the city through it, and now they, uh, King City of Kingston has less than, uh, I think, uh, 20 active cases. I think it's around uh, 17 cases. I could be mistaken. But uh, fantastic leadership, and Ontario, I think, is going to do really well under Dr. Moore. That's fantastic. Let's shift gears and talk international affairs. Let's talk about the G20, because we know that, uh, you know, there was obviously the health summit. They're they're sort of taking a bit of a lead in terms of managing this crisis. Is it too little too late, Jeffrey, or are you thinking this is a good thing? I'm thinking this is a good thing because uh, the international community over the past year during the global pandemic um, has really mounted a, a failed response. Instead of pulling together and devising a collective strategy to control the spread of COVID-19. The most powerful and wealthy nations of the world instead basically signed uh, bilateral deals with uh, drug manufacturers to secure uh, COVID vaccines for themselves, but they basically left out low and middle income countries. Uh, But the good news is after more than a year of a a disorganized and inequitable response to the pandemic, there is reason to hope that the G20 will play a a pivotal role in bringing the global health crisis under control. So you just mentioned that the Global Health Summit in Rome, which was uh, uh, just a little over a week ago, and the the president of the G20, the Italian Prime Minister uh, Mario Draghi, uh, declared that that the global crisis is not over. I know in Canada it's starting to feel like things are getting back to normal. You know, we're going to see uh, fans uh, in the stands tonight for the, the big game. But the fact is, around the world, the pandemic is accelerating. For example, over the weekend, there's very uh, disturbing news coming out of Vietnam. There's a new variant that supposedly uh, uh, mixes the so-called UK variant with the uh, so-called Indian variant to become a super variant. And so the bottom line is, unless we vaccinate the entire world, we're going to see uh, these variants arise. They are going to be resistant to uh, the therapeutics that they're developing to, to treat COVID-19. But more importantly, they may escape um, the vaccines that we're developing to prevent COVID-19. So it's important for uh, everybody in the world to promote vaccine equity. And that is what the G20 is aiming to do. So the background is basically the G20 is uh, the uh, most uh, powerful uh, wealthy countries known as the G7 mixed with uh, emerging key economies from around the world. And this was the brainchild of then uh, Finance Minister Paul Martin and then Finance Minister Gordon Brown of the United Kingdom. This was back in the 1990s. And they, they thought the G20 could be this parallel 
organization to the the G7, and it could bring together uh, all of these different uh, economies and points of view and take uh, more effective action to manage uh, global crises and uh, the global economy. So um, last week, the uh, the G20's uh, uh, panel of uh, health experts um, put forward a, a set of uh, recommendations about the pandemic. And they basically said what I just said about uh, the moral imperative uh, and the, the central nature of vaccine equity. equity. It's really important, according to these experts, to develop vaccines, second generation vaccines that will deal with the variants and make sure that these um, vaccines are available everywhere. So the G20, the bottom line is the G20 has come up with a, an action plan to address the uh, the pandemic. So the, the president of the European Con, uh, Commission uh, put forward this plan and, and this is the basic outline of the plan. Plank one in the whole thing is uh, ensuring that more vaccines are exported from Europe to developing countries, in particular Africa. Africa is the least vaccinated uh, continent in the world. Just a fraction of the COVID vaccines are going there. Uh, in second, the, uh, the, the president of the uh, European Commission um, announced that uh, in, in a little pre-summit gathering that the industrial partners, the, the manufacturers of vaccines, have agreed to deliver 1.3 billion doses this year to low-income countries at no profit. And uh, they'll only be uh, they'll only charge a, a lower price to middle-income countries. So that's good news. Also, next year, uh, according to the uh, the president, uh, 1.3 billion doses will also be delivered uh, to developing countries, and this will probably be through COVAX, and that's that international vaccine coalition that will provide vaccines to low and middle income countries. And right. the the third component of this plan is something called the Team Europe initiative and it will basically uh, aim to develop regional vaccine distribution hubs across Africa and this initiative will be underwritten uh, by the European Union and there will be an investment of 1 billion uh, euros and this the aim of it basically is to make uh, Africa less dependent on uh, vaccine imports because right now about 99% of uh, Africa's vaccines are imported. And when you have a crisis like COVID, uh, national borders come up and countries put uh, export bans in place. And that means that the, the hardest hit areas or the most vulnerable areas may be left with no vaccines at all. So I think that's um, a pretty good uh, a start by the G20. They're doing what probably should have been done by the international community a year ago. So I am cautiously optimistic today. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Where do you think Canada is going to be ranked? If we were to look back on this, let's say even five years from now, um, how do you think Canada will be ranked in terms of how they worked with the international community in relation to COVID? Yeah, it's going to be a mixed grade. I, I don't like to be pessimistic, but um, on the plus side, Canada was uh, one of the first countries to jump in and support uh, the access to uh, COVID uh, technologies and to support um, uh, the COVAX. And these are international initiatives to make sure that vaccines are available, uh, that therapeutics are developed, that testing is, is developed and, and shared. So Canada was on board right at the beginning and Canada was uh, funding that when the United States was not. Um, the United States is, has subsequently signed on under the Biden administration. Um, the problem is Canada is one of these wealthy countries that has signed all these bilateral deals with vaccine manufacturers. We have theoretically um, secured 400 million doses of vaccines. We only have a population of a, about 38 million people. Uh, we can vaccinate this country many times over. We have not yet come up with a plan to distribute our excess doses of COVID vaccines. Uh, we've got to, the Trudeau government's got to come up with a plan right now. And we've got to make sure that um, in the coming months, uh, uh, all the healthcare workers in the developing world are vaccinated. And then we've got to look beyond that to figure out how we're going to ensure that everybody on the planet um, gets a vaccine dose uh, because everybody needs to be vaccinated. And then we've got to figure out how we're 
we're going to ensure that the developing world has access to the booster shots that we're all going to need, you know, next year and the year after that. So it's the story is not finished. Uh, Canada can still uh, change its rankings, but right now I'd say Canada's middle of the pack. Thank you so much, Jeffrey Johnson. Always appreciate your time. Thanks, Sam. Of course, Jeffrey Johnson from the Kingston Whig Standard sharing his thoughts on international affairs. Let me ask you this. Did you know there is some dealings going on between Saunders Farms and the Flying Canoe Cider Company? We're going to Find out all the details when we come back with David Sally, editor of the Ottawa Business Journal, here on City News. It started out with a small outdoor booth in what was called Artist Alley, which is actually the area just outside our store on William Street, uh, where for a couple of years we sold uh, our jewelry uh, directly on the street. And then we slowly evolved to having an indoor uh, location in this building, 55 Barwood Market Square. We then moved to another location in Place de Ville and then moved back down here on Dalhousie Street at Eargear in the 90s and then back into this building again in, uh, in 2000 as a collection. I do a collection of jewelry called Cirque that's uh, mainly uh, beaded work with a combination of semi-precious and uh, vintage beads. And then she does a hat collection uh, called Fanfreluche, that's all cut and sewn hats in a variety of fabrics and for uh, all of the seasons of the year. We've curated and sourced the artisans that we represent in a lot of different ways over the years since it's been, you know, uh, since 1985. Uh, some people come to us since we're known and uh, other artisans that we represent might uh, recommend that they come and see us. Uh, some people we find at craft shows or we see uh, their work, somebody wears it in and we go and track it down and bring it. And then some people interestingly are with us in one medium and then sometimes they evolve to another. They're all Canadian and mainly local. Um, with the roughly 50 people that we have, I'd say more than half of those are Ottawa Gatineau and then the rest are from other uh, cities in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, um, Vancouver, etc. If you can afford it, go to a small business and spend some money. It's lovely when you come in and, you know, give me a pep talk and tell me how much you love this place and you've been coming here for years. But if you can afford it, please spend some money too, because all the pep talks in the world are not going to pay my rent which is still full rent even when we're closed. Then secondly, if you can't afford to spend money, follow the businesses that you want to support on social media. Go to their Instagram, go to their Facebook, follow their Twitter, and then retweet. Uh, share their Facebook page, like and comment, because if you can't afford to, as many of us can right now, to do extra expenditures, Doing all of those little things like that will raise the visibility of those small businesses and hopefully for them result in some online or curbside or other uh, business for them. Strong opinions. Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Okay, let me ask you this. Have you taken your kids to Saunders Farms? Probably. Have you ever had a cider from Flying Canoe? Probably. Why are they connected? That's why we need to talk to David Sally from the Ottawa Business Journal. How are you, David? <laughs> I'm pretty good, Sam. How are you? You liked how I teed that up, did you? <laughs> yeah, I sure did. <laughs> so let's talk about that, because of course I've taken my kids to, or my kids, I've only got the one. Uh, I've taken my kid to uh, Saunders Farms, and of course I've enjoyed a cider. Why are we talking about them in the same sentence today? Uh, well, yeah, you, you, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering that. Uh, 
uh, but although judging by the popularity of this story I'm about to talk, talk about, I think a lot of people have already uh, figured it out. Um, so, Saunders Farm, yeah, as you say, uh, Sam, one of the uh, most famous farms in Ottawa, if not the most famous, just about mm-hmm. everybody. If you haven't been there, you know about it. Uh, it's Halloween, uh, you know, sort of activities are legendary. Um, uh, you and uh, and I mean, just about every family has probably been at, uh, there with their kids at one point. Well, uh, Mark Saunders, uh, the owner, has for years he he has dreamed. Uh, he's had another dream besides just operating a successful tourism business. That is, he's, he 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 wants to make cider. So uh, it's always something he's wanted to do. So he recently. Uh, heard that uh, that Flying Canoe Hard Cider, based in Spencerville, if you say very popular local cider, um, that it was for sale. Uh, Pete Rainville, the owner, decided it was time that he felt like he wanted to get out of the business. So Mark heard this, called him up uh, just in a, literally a matter of weeks. The deal was signed. He bought Flying Canoe Hard Cider. And uh, and is going to start producing cider on Saunders Farm. So there you go. That's the connection, Sam. He hopes to to start uh, to get their first batch uh, ready for sale by Canada Day. And now they're they are for now going to be sa- sourcing the apples from the same place uh, Flying Canoe gets theirs from. But they're uh, you, uh, Mark says they're also going to. Uh, uh, you know, start their own apple orchard uh, on Saunders Farm. They've got a hundred acres. There are lots of room to grow, so to speak. So, um, so he's going to start growing apples there. And in fact, he's taking this very seriously. Sam Mark is, um, <laughs> in fact, taking a uh, cider making course from Cornell University. Wow. So he's been doing that. He's uh, he's been consulting with um, with with an, with an uh, orchardist uh, through the Ministry of Agriculture. So he said he loves apples. And really wants to get in there, get his hands dirty, and uh, and really ramp up the operation and uh, see where he can take it. I don't know if it's just the pandemic or, you know, I just loved this story. I loved it that it was local. I loved that it was a success story. It's the story we need right now, isn't it, David? Well, absolutely. It, it is a great story. You know, We've talked a lot, Sam, over the last 15 months or so about businesses that are struggling during the pandemic, mm-hmm. trying to pivot, all of that stuff. And uh, and here's an example of a you know a very successful local tourism business that that's been hit like like all businesses in that industry. Um, and uh, and and here Mark had some downtime, decided now is the time to really uh, go after his dream, so to speak, and he's doing it and. And um, and the and Pete Rainville also he's pretty excited. He's going to stay on for a while, help out with the transition. And uh, you know, his quote was, "It's time to let the flying canoe soar." I love so it. So he's really open that it, uh, yeah, that it that this really takes off. That maybe Mark can take it to that next level. Uh, of mm-hmm. course, they sell at the LCBO. They um, uh, already and they sell at uh, various other retailers. So I mean, they they really think. Uh, they can keep growing this um, this thing, and and Mark feels like, you know, he's an optimistic guy by nature, as he says. It's in my DNA to be optimistic. This is going to start to turn around as uh, you know the vaccinations ramp up, more uh, more restrictions start to get loosened, and uh, he's looking forward to this coming um, season, saying it could be uh, uh, you know more successful than ever. They would typically. Uh, you know, draw about 100,000 visitors a year. And um, he thinks those numbers are not just going to get back to what they were pre-pandemic, but are going to keep growing. So um, uh, as he calls it, it's a mutual love. Oh, the love community it. supports Saunders Farm, and they're supporting the community. And, uh, yeah, just a, just a really nice story. Mm-hmm. I've spoke to both those uh, those entrepreneurs, and both of them are just, you know, they're just uh, just lovely people. Like, you can just tell they're, this is just, the, you know, what they do. This is kind of who they are. So I love that so much. Absolutely. L- let's head yeah. to the little town, my one of my favorite towns of Almont. Some exciting stuff happening there with the dairy distillery. Yes, a uh, bit of a theme here this morning, uh, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> yes. I think you'll pick it up quickly. Uh Last week, actually, uh, it was, it's funny, last week Rob and I were talking beer, 
It is Vivi Brewery. Now we just talked cider. Well, now let's move into another uh, area of them called the Spirits. Um, and there's a little, there's a business out in Elmont called Dairy Distillery, which, as the name suggests, is exactly that. It makes vodka out of milk. Um, it, well, more specifically, a milk byproduct called milk permeate. Mm-hmm. That's what's left over uh, after cream, fat, and other proteins have been removed from whole milk. So they take that and they, believe it or not, make vodka out of it, cream liqueurs, all kinds of stuff. Um, well, they, they've been growing like crazy. They were founded in 2018. They made, our, they made the number two spot in our list this year of fastest growing companies. They've grown their revenues 2,000% since they opened. Uh, and, um, and now they've gotten, they're, they're gonna grow even more. They got more fuel last week. They got $4.8 million in uh, in new venture capital from a uh, private equity fund uh, based in Tilsonburg in southwestern Ontario called Ag Capital Canada, uh, and they're really looking forward to using that money to uh, to really ramping up their production. They're going to build a, actually a large scale ethanol plant that can produce five to eight million liters a year of low carbon ethanol for transport fuel. Um, because they've already got that technology. They're producing hand sanitizer. Mm-hmm. So they're already, they've, they're, they've already kind of got a foot in the ethanol space, and so they're doing that. And they really li- love the fact that, they're, that, they're, uh, that their vodka, uh, called vodka, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, appropriately enough, yes. uh, and their other li- liqueurs are really growing, and they're going to try and expand. They're in talks with a U.S. firm right now, to start rolling out the products uh, south of the border, hopefully within the next two years, um, and uh, and yeah, they really just think that um, that you know the that the, they, they could be on to something big here and really keep growing. So uh, um, so yeah, another another really interesting uh, story from the uh, mm. from the small town of Elmont. We only have about thirty seconds, David. Do you feel the roaring twenty twenties are just around the corner? <laughs> well, uh, Sam, I definitely think there's going to be uh, uh, at, at least a, you, an, an upswing. It, uh, I'm people, people are, you can tell, they are, they are, there's, there's pent up, uh, you, you know, uh, p- people have been cooped up for 15 months now. They want to get out, enjoy themselves, uh, get out and experience things they haven't been able to for a while. So I don't know if it's going to be as roaring as the Roaring Twenties were, um, but I think we're definitely going to see a lot of activity um, awesome. <laughs> around town. That's Fantastic. For sure. I love hearing that. David, Sally, always a pleasure to speak with you, editor for the Ottawa Business Journal. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. When we come back, we're going to talk a little hockey. I don't know if you know, there's a game seven tonight, you know, Habs versus Lease. We're going to talk to Kenny Vrare. Stay with us here on City News.
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Monday, the 31st of May. Good morning. I'm Sarah Buck, and right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, we've got nice bright sunshine and 17 degrees. Here's what's making news this hour. Provincial health officials report 50 new cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa. Out of 916 across Ontario, the province is reporting 13 new deaths due to the virus. Elsewhere locally, Leeds Grenville Lanark Health Unit has no new cases of COVID-19, but has added one case to its total from a previous date. Public Health Ontario reports three new cases in eastern Ontario and one new case in Renfrew County. Local health units will update their numbers in the afternoon. Today's kickoff of Ontario's accelerated COVID-19 vaccination second shot plan is not without its hiccups. Ottawa Public Health is sharing on Twitter that it is aware of ongoing issues with the provincial vaccine booking system this morning. While some sharing their successes in booking new appointments for second shots for elderly parents and loved ones, others have encountered messages stating that there are no available appointments in your area. The health unit says it is working with provincial partners to resolve the issue, adding that once issues are resolved, available appointments will be based on vaccine supply. There are growing concerns that the discovery of the remains of 215 Indigenous children buried on the site of a former residential school in Kamloops, B.C. will be damaging to young people in Chilliwack. Teacher Rick Joe is asking school counselors, administrators and youth care workers to take extra time checking in on Indigenous students. Flags are being lowered to half-mast on public buildings across the country, including the Peace Tower on Parliament Hill. There are calls for ground-penetrating radar searches of the sites of other residential schools across this country. I'm Sarah Buckin for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. The world is changing. So keep up with Rob. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Rob Snow Show. I really appreciate uh, all of our listeners today tuning in. Of course, we're on Rogers TV too. Thank you so much for viewing us there. I wanted to speak about hockey and, you know, a little football. So who do I go to? I go to my friend, Kenny Vrare. How are you, Ken? Hey, Sam. I'm good. How are you? I think you're the king of Barhaven, by the way. I would I would not even come close to the Maybe the court jester, but not the king. Can I tell you why? Is because you are one of the only people I've seen in public <laughs> during this pandemic. We right. saw each other with masks on. I think it was Canadian Tire when we were allowed to go inside. Right. And then I see you riding your bike around, so it's fantastic. You're keeping healthy. You know, uh, active body and active helps you keep an active mind, and and, and you got to keep moving, right? So the and funny, it's ironic. So the COVID sniper doesn't get you. Uh, because mental health and physical health is so important through everything we've gone through. For sure. And of course, you've got three kids at home. So God yeah. bless you in terms of all those school and everything else you're dealing with. So thank you so much. And thanks for taking time out today to talk about sports. There's a little game tonight. Sure. Are you going to be watching? I will be watching. And, and it's funny, uh, I really disconnected from sports for the most part for the last year and a half, as a lot of people have. But knowing that these games mean something, uh, I think uh, people are connecting, and um, it's it's funny. I think in a funny way, it, it takes your mind off of everything we've been through. The light that we've always we've all been sort of hoping for that light at the end of the tunnel, mm-hmm. and and for many of us now, it's been so long that we realize that that light is a train. For sure, <laughs> right? absolutely, right? absolutely. Right? And so to have something that feels normal, to be able to cheer on your favorite team or cheer against. Uh, the team, <laughs> you know, your hated team. I'm not going to mention because we have Leafs and Habs fans listening. But right. oh, to get involved in a way is kind of a sense of norm for us. For sure. It was certainly a nail biter on Saturday night. And yeah. tonight I expect the same thing. Uh, you're, you're a professional athlete. Of course, now you're a coach. You're, you're just, you're just a great, great guy. I mean, let, let's just put it that way. You've got lots of things going on. Yeah. You've been uh, uh, in those locker rooms on those big nights What's it like? How was how an athlete oh. do you prepare for the big stage? Well, you're, you'll hear athletes say, you got to treat like it's another game, but it's not another game. And you, you almost lie to yourself because you, you, you don't want to be too panicked. You don't want to be too tight. You don't want to be the one thinking about there's five or six moments in a game that are turning points football, hockey, baseball, regardless of the sport. And you just don't want to be the guy who owns that unless it's. Uh, 
in favor of winning the game. Mm-hmm. And so you got you got to be loosey-goosey. And the great thing is that the teams have built enough team chemistry now that the room isn't that tight. The room isn't you – know, now, the coach's speech, if, if a coach go to, goes out of his way, and this is why I love – because from the leadership and coaching standpoint, that I, I, that's my business, I always, I always want to hear what – I'm curious what the coach is going to say. Is he going to go out of sort of the regular, hey, guys, this is what we got to do, let's go get him? Does he have a new Rockney speech? Does he want to get them all fired up? Or does he not say anything? which is also kind of odd for a lot of guys. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see what the coaches will say to their teams uh, tonight uh, going into this match. It's going to be so exciting, of course. Uh, And I don't know if you've heard the news because it's just breaking news that 550 frontline workers that are fully vaccinated get to be in the stands tonight. Can you even imagine getting that call, Ken? It's one I wish you could have more of our frontline workers there. Because they certainly deserve to be rewarded, but knowing that there's going to be over 500 in attendance, it's going to be a great experience. Um, Again, it's that sentimental tie to the game of hockey that we have, and we're celebrating heroes, not just the heroes on the ice. And and the funny thing is, when we we talk about heroes and athletes, we use that a lot, but the real heroes will be in the stands watching the game, right? The idea of uh, you know. We'll forget who wins and loses this game a month from now. You know, uh, the team, one of the teams might go on to win the cup. Great, but uh, those frontline workers, those people are going in day in and day out, and their new normal has changed dramatically. And to recognize them and give them credit is, is, I think, is special. Absolutely incredible. Let's shift gears, of course. I loved watching you as an Ottawa Rough Rider, of course, receiver, really a hometown boy. We loved watching you. Do you (laughs) miss it, Ken? Do you miss it? My heart does. My left knee does it. My back (laughs) does it. My rib cage does it. Uh, I I, I miss it. Uh, What I really miss, the funny thing is I miss my my son Elijah was talking about this yesterday. We're we're out by Rideau Falls hanging out, and they were doing it on their scooters, and and we're talking about football coming back. And he really misses going to the games and and just hanging out and and spending time with Darren Joseph, his de facto uncle. Right. right? And and <laughs> and uh, I loved playing the game. Uh, and the funny thing is, I wasn't as competitive as maybe a lot of people were or thought I was. I didn't take the game home with me per se, but I loved being in that environment. I loved coming out of the door into the arena, into the stadium, and competing against really good athletes. Mm-hmm. And, and I think I think fans will miss that. I think what fans really miss is the social connection they have going to games, and it, it's changed dramatically here in Ottawa. With the old stadium, it was a bit of a dump. It was we're starting to fall apart, but now you go to Red Blacks games. And it's a football game, but it's also very much a social event where we can connect with people. You're seeing mm-hmm. people from your high school. You're seeing people from your universities. You get to dress up in plaid and cheer on the home team and, and boo the, the opposing team. And uh, I can't wait for that to happen. I know it's going to be a later start, but sometimes, you know, they say patience is a virtue, right? For sure. One of my favorite stories that you tell, and there's a lot, but one of my <laughs> favorite stories is as a young boy, yeah. watching the Rough Riders. And can you just share 30 seconds of that story? It's it's brilliant. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, and the Rough Riders are obviously important to us because they come to the Boys and Girls Club and sign autographs So Tony Gabriel and all the players like a name. But because we didn't have a lot of money, and I remember we not didn't have tickets, and my dad took us, took, my, took me to a game, and they had the ticket boxes outside the stadium, and people would line up to get their game day tickets. And we couldn't get any tickets, and my dad was hopeful, but what he did was he – he put me up on his shoulders and got me to climb on top of the ticket box. And I only saw two thirds of the field. It was Ottawa Hamilton, but the crowd, the energy. And I remember thinking someday I'm going to be there. I'm going to be on that field. I didn't want to be in the stands. I wanted to be in the field playing for the Ottawa Rough Riders. And, and that, that, that was a passion of mine growing up. And, and, uh, essentially that's the nuts and the bolts of the story is, uh, I, I, I didn't, I didn't believe it would become a reality, but I wanted to give everything I could to make it become a reality. I'll give myself a chance. So then your first step onto that field, take yep. me there. 
it was a practice field. Well, I've been on the field many times as a kid playing, but I remember as a rough rider, I came out for practice. I was traded there by Saskatchewan, and I came out and put my helmet on, and uh, my mom and dad were in the stands. I'm not sure if you've seen the photo on my Facebook page, but my mom and dad were in the stands watching practice, and my dad's holding an umbrella over my mom in the stands. They're the only ones in the stands watching as I went through my very first practice as an Ottawa rough rider, and that was that was pretty cool to wear that R on the side of the helmet, and and again it came full circle uh they walked in for free they never had to go to a game and worry about tickets like we did when we were kids i gotta be honest that story always makes me emotional uh (laughs) always emotional every single time so let's talk about the cfl we know that it's obvious a delayed uh start what are you hoping for this season i know you and darren joseph of course uh obviously a fantastic uh football player as well now an ottawa police officer uh you do this great uh storytelling around the game i love it so much what are you hoping for well, just to just to get back and connect, it's a step towards normal for everybody in the community. Mm-hmm. Now the football players get to bring that to the community, and and uh, I, I think you know gathering. We're, it's part of our DNA, Sam, to be connected with other people, to connect, to communicate, collaborate, and and conquer, or in this case, party. And uh, we're desperate for that. And, and if we can do that at, at TD Place and celebrate the Red Blacks, I think they're going to be a pretty good football team with coach, head coach Paul LaPolice. Uh, it's going to be a sign. It's going to be a reward, a pat on our back for getting through the past two years. Because I didn't have to deal with a global pandemic when I was a child. But to be able to take my kids now after two years, uh, it's going to be a significant. It's going to be emotional for all of us, I think, and and uh, it'll be fun to see some familiar faces. Absolutely, take me to that that athlete in you, uh, yeah. and and how have athletes kept themselves uh, not only physically, uh, you know, vibrant at this time, but also, of course, mentally. That mental game is such a big piece. The mental part is so hard because it, it, it's when a test you're going to find out who really loves the game. And that goes with kids playing competitive hockey, kids who are playing house league hockey, any sport, because you've been away from it and it's been taken away. Uh, now you get to reconnect with it. Now, these athletes, they don't get rich in the CFL. So, one, you're oftentimes making things work in the offseason so you get your first game check in the CFL. It's not like the NFL. So you haven't got a lot of money in the bank. So those guys who decide to stick it, stick through this whole pandemic and get back to playing football and represent the Red Blacks again, uh, it's a credit to their love for the game because it's tough. They can find work. A lot of guys are retired. A lot of guys have decided, Look, I'm done. That's, that chapter's done. i got to take care of my family and get through this pandemic. But for those guys who do come back and put on that jersey, it's a real credit to them as athletes, physically and mentally, because it's so tough. Because you have other people saying, you know, maybe it's time to hang them up. You can't play football forever. And I've always said, play football for as long as you can, because once it's get done... You may think you can go back and play, but mm-hmm. deep down, you know you can't. I'd like to think that I can still go pro football, but my kids will just shake their head and say, Dad, no, that's <laughs> not going to work. That's not going to happen. Uh, I love the honesty of children, though, right? Uh, that's yeah. always important. Uh, how difficult do you think as an athlete is it to to think about those that layer of COVID protocols? Like, you know, I mean, you know, not, not to be cheeky, but it's a bit of a pain, right? I mean, all the things that they have to do, obviously, safety first, but that's going to be yeah. an another layer right it is it really is and and i think we're we're far along now where i think athletes are really comfortable in how in terms of protocols uh there's a bit of a learning curve and you know there's some growth that you had to go through to figure out how do we do this how does the cfl because the cfl couldn't afford to host their own bubble but they can certainly can provide a controlled environment mm-hmm. for these athletes to not worry about it. And so I don't think it's much of a concern because we're so far along now. If they tried to start a football year, you know, last year and stay on and get on time, I think there would be a lot more concern. And and with people getting vaccinated now, funny thing, the irony is I got my first shot this morning. Oh, wow. And, and uh, uh, just, just that sense of relief. A lot of people are posting photos of themselves getting their needles and the whole bit. And, and the, the collective theme is the sense of relief that they have mm-hmm. now that they got the first shot and even the second shot. And I thought, okay, yeah, right. Maybe be a little emotional, but I got my needle and I, I, I understood what they're, what they were experiencing, mm-hmm. what they felt. And I think for the athletes, uh, 
the number one thing is manage the factors that you that are at play, but minimize them. You don't want to have to worry about ten things; only worry about two things. And the, I think the successful teams are the ones who create an environment where the athletes can go in and just be athletic. Athletes don't want to think; we want to be athletes. Yeah, absolutely. Dare I ask who you're taking in tonight's game, Habs or Leafs? Uh, my brother's a Leaf fan, so in, in all honesty, my solidarity should be with him, but. I've always cheered for the underdog, always cheered for the underdog. And the storyline is the Habs go in and do something nobody believed they could do outside the province of Quebec, and that's win in Toronto tonight. So I think the, I think the Habs might pull it off. Okay, you're taking Habs. I'm taking Leafs. I can't even believe I'm saying that, actually. Who's, who's going to score the game winner for your Leafs, then? I think it's Ashton, um, uh, Matthews. You're going to say Austin? Okay. Yeah, Austin Matthews. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to say it's Montreal winning, and the game winner comes from the young kid, Caulfield, the Caulfield. Oh, yes. I love kid. watching him. Yeah, I absolutely. Watch him do his thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I so, know exactly. I think Canada is going to shut down tonight for this game. Uh, we are not home. Uh, try, try another number is going to be what uh, Canada responds to if anyone's trying to talk to us tonight. Uh, Kenny Frere, it is always a pleasure. Value your time as always. Sammy. Good to hear your voice. We'll chat soon, and we'll we'll see we'll probably see each other sooner. I look forward to seeing you walking around Barhaven, my friend. I'll see you in the haven. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Take care. When we come back, we're going to speak to one of my favorite people, and of course, that's Kevin Cohane from the Chio Foundation. You probably want to support Chio like we all do. Find out how you can when we return on Rogers TV and City News. I always knew I was going to own my own business um, and I've always wanted to have a store um, and I sort of figured when the right concept came together at the right time I would move forward with that plan and so through uh, doing some environmental initiatives in the restaurant group that I was with prior to opening this store it just triggered my path towards being more environmentally conscientious and wanting to make more of a difference and hopefully encouraging, inspiring other people to want to do the same, at which point the idea for All Eco was born. I have some really fine products. I have a really wide spectrum of products. So the things we look for in terms of qualifying products are uh, sustainably made, um, upcycled, recycled, zero waste, um, all natural, no harmful chemicals to like the environment or to our bodies. Uh, we have like fun stuff, so like really clean burning candles, lots of really um, natural body care and skin care. I put a real emphasis on Canadian products. Um, I really try to support up and comers and uh, I, always, I always source Canada first. The refill bar is really important to me. It's really huge, I think. Um, that's been exciting as well because I thought it was going to be a real process in convincing people that this is a better way to to go and actually it was just like right away there was a built-in um, affinity towards doing refill which has been great we closed I think probably we were closed down by before the second week of March just didn't feel we could comfortably or confidently stay open even though I do sell essential products like with in terms of the cleaning um, but we just didn't feel we could make a safe space for ourselves or our customers at that time and especially with the information we had at the time so we did close our doors at which point i did not have a website because that was only i hadn't even scheduled myself to have a website at that point so that was sort of like full speed moving towards that and trying to drive the business at the same time still get myself on the map because i was so new um so during that time, as we were building um, the website, we were still doing a lot of video shopping and private shopping, online shopping, or sorry, like online phone, text, any way I could do business, I was doing it. And there was really a nice show of support for my business during that time, which was really, really encouraging. Um, and now, you know, we, we are fully set up online too. Fun.
The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Well, we're in our final time here on The Rob Snow Show. I'm Sam LaPrad. We I've had a series of, of really interesting stories today. Everything from, of course, talking about uh, the lost lives, 215 Indigenous children in Kamloops. That has certainly uh, really enveloped uh, much of our, our day today. And uh, of course, every Canadian is thinking about the families and those children, the lost lives. We've talked about business. We've talked about lots of different things. We've just heard David Smith, our producer here, has indicated uh, that uh, Premier Doug Ford has indicated in the next day or two, he will talk about schools. That's no. right. Yes, that's uh, that's coming to us from Cynthia Mulligan, City TV Queens Park reporter. Uh, she she, she uh, spoke with the premier at it seems at Queens Park this morning. We actually have a little bit of audio from the premier here. It's coming from Cynthia's Twitter feed. This is what he had to say about schools. We're looking at all the responses o- over the the weekend. We'll have an announcement uh, in the next day or two. And uh, we'll, we'll get out there and make that announcement about uh, going back to school or not. That's okay. all we get for now. Well, I've got to tell you, I think parents are very disappointed to hear that. We want to know one way or another as a parent of a 13-year-old in grade 8, I will tell you, I want to know, is she going back for the last three weeks or is this it? So parents are definitely going to be watching. Here on City News, this is where you'll want to be. That story, as soon as we hear anything, we will break those those important words to you. So definitely stay with us. We wanted to go to Kevin Cohane, of course, president and CEO of the Chio Foundation. Hi, Kevin. Good morning, Sam. Every parent on the planet's thinking about what's happening with school, but we think about the parents, of course, at Chio that are just looking for their little ones to be better. And of course, the Chio Foundation uh, raising really important money uh, to ensure that families are, are best served in health care. And you've got a very important week. We really do. It's a, you know, and what I would say, Sam, is that this is not just an important week for the for the Chio Foundation. It's actually an important week for the community, because you know the Chio Foundation is merely a reflection of how the community feels about supporting kids and families who are sick, injured, um, kids with physical developmental challenges. You know, Chio is a community asset. So it's really, it's how do we respond to the needs of these kids and families? And the, re- the reality is we do it together. And, and that's what makes this week really, really important. And there's no two ways about it. Uh, all of the things you mentioned are really, really important. Let's talk about mental health. I think this is a really important piece. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of obviously spending time with with uh, all of you uh, virtually, of course, just talking about CHEO throughout this, uh, this pandemic. And we know that the numbers are up in terms of mental health. And we know that a great partner, TD, has come through for you. What does that mean? So it means a lot. I mean, I, you know, it, it, the business community, I don't think, gets enough maybe credit or recognition. Uh, without a business community, there is no community. If there aren't businesses that are viable, that are have people working at them, keep the economy going, we don't have a community. So it, they understand this, and it's integral um, to, the, to, to the work that we do because without the support of the business community and people like TD, organizations like TD, we just simply couldn't provide the support for um, kids and families. And right now we have a mental health crisis going on. And, uh, and, and their donation is, is helping us to address that. And, and they're to be commended for that. Absolutely. And we've seen a number of other businesses step up. The telethon is this beautiful mix of, of the business community, like you just said, but also of individuals, each and every one of us, you know, whether we're, we're donating $25 or $100 or $1,000, maybe we're, we're, maybe we're taking our gas money from 2020 and thinking, you know, I didn't spend that much on gas. I'm going to give a, a really uh, important gift to Chio uh, for the telethon. How would they go about that? And, and what, what can we look forward to for the telethon? So what, you're, what you've just suggested, Sam, is, is exactly the kinds of things that people are thinking about. And we're, we're, we're seeing that and people are um, rising to the occasion. They're making donations. Right now we're in the middle of sharing our six patient stories, uh, each one of them really remarkable. Each of them uh, are being shared uh, through email and social media. They'll be shown once again during our uh, grand finale broadcast on CTV Ottawa on, uh, on uh, Sunday, June the 6th. Um, but people can go to Chiotelethon.com uh, 
and they can see these stories, they can make their donations, they can have them matched by our corporate partners, and they can feel very proud that they are part of uh, of an entire community effort that's pulling together to make sure that the kids in our community have the supports they need when they need them. And there's no two ways about it. You and your team are fantastic. You always send me those stories, and I always brace myself because they're very, very emotional, Kevin. Uh, We only have about, you know, a sort of a minute or two. Yeah. Walk us through somebody that's really had their life touched at CHEO and and really uh, been impacted by the foundation. So uh, there would be so many to to, to cite that I'd be reluctant. I'll just, you know, and I hate using myself, but I, I will use myself because... Um, you know, 20, 20, almost 25 years ago, uh, my wife and I had a, our second child, premature, um, uh, experience with having health issues uh, while premature was, went to, was eventually transferred to CHEO uh, by our neonatal transport team uh, who saved his life. So what I didn't realize at the time, um, because I was not at CHEO at that time, but you, you realize later that the equipment that was used to bring him there, the diagnostic equipment that was used once he got there, the surgical equipment that was used for him while he was there, the support programs that were made available to us while we were there, uh, the volunteer program that was also helping, all of these things were supported through the community um, to make it so that our uh, visit to CHEO was, you know, uh, uneventful in that we got to go home and never had to go back after life-saving uh, work was done. And and I'm just one of thousands and thousands and thousands of, of examples. And, you know, they, what we're trying to do is make people understand that the support that they got, it didn't come from the CHEO Foundation. It came through the CHEO Foundation, but the support came from the community. So everybody that's a donor, every organization that supports us, every event organizer, every company that sponsors our events or other events, you're all helping. And Sam, you're helping right now by helping us to share the word that this is what we need to do in order to take care of the kids of our community. It's so important. Uh, our community seems to recognize it, and we're looking for that support to come in uh, big and big and strong over the course of the next several days. Beautifully said, as always. Kevin Cohen, we are sending you oodles and oodles of love and lots of support as you head into, of course, the CHEO uh, Telethon. Thank you so much, Sam. I appreciate your help once again. Thank you. Always a pleasure. When, uh, you know, when we think about what's happened uh, this week, uh, we know that, of course, 215 Indigenous children have been located in a grave site at a residential school in Kamloops. Uh, We're not going to stop talking about this, and neither should you. If you don't know uh, about residential schools, I'm certainly going to educate myself more on them uh, and let these children not die in vain. Let us use this as a learning opportunity let us uh, ask for uh, more um, inquiries are there more grave sites let's use this as an opportunity to become a stronger country Uh, i'm sam laprad filling in for rob snow thank you so much for listening to city news this program is brought to you by ignite tv now you're in command Visit rogers.com for more details. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. On the next Simply Cooking by Chef, a few hours of meal preparation once a week can save you time and money later on. I love to have a chicken roasted ready to go for the rest of the week. You can use it for so many different uh, recipes, meals, and even as a snack. No matter your dietary restrictions, Chef Daniela has many other options you can do. Find out what they are on Simply Cooking by Chef right here on Rogers TV. The Canadian film and TV industry recognizes it's time to build a better workforce, which includes more opportunities for Black, Indigenous, and persons of color. HireBIPOC.com is here to help make this happen. Whether you're already in the business, trying to get a start, or in a position to hire, HireBIPOC.com could connect you to the right people. From script to development, production to post, distribution to marketing. Check out HireBIPOC.com now and help build a stronger industry together.